Good afternoon. The April 25th, 2023 board work session is now in order. Paul, roll call, please. Mr. Susan? Here. Ms. Wright? Here. Mr. Trent? Here. Ms. Campbell? Here. Ms. Jenkins? Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first topic is board member district boundary adjustments. Um, board members, I would say we got a huge agenda. So if we can, you'll see me moving pretty quickly. Um, if we can go with that, it'd be great. Uh, everybody good? All right. Mr. Sarah Chair, Lee. Me, uh, yes, let me introduce Sarah Lee Morrissey. Uh, Sarah is with Sarah Lee Morrissey Consulting, and she is working with WXYZ, our, I'm sorry, WXY. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. I'm on it. Our uh, planning consultant firm, and they are going to give you kind of a snapshot of what they heard regarding board member redistricting as a prelude for the board's discussion as to where we go from here. So, Sarah Lee, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here, board members. Uh, I'm Sarah Lee Morrissey. I am your neighbor. I uh, live right up the street in Volusia, so I'm happy to be here in person. And yes, Z does follow WXY, but not in their company name. And uh, so with me this afternoon is, are my colleagues, Raphael Loud, and uh, also Adam Lubinsky is also with us, although I may need somebody. Uh, oh, I see him. Uh, we have to admit. There he is. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, give me just a second to get this. There we go. And okay. All right. So, based on the direction that Ms. Hahn received from you at your March 22nd meeting, she enlisted the assistance of WXY, who is an annual planning consultant with you, and asked uh, or authorized uh, WXY and myself to proceed to have conversations with each of you about board redistricting and to also speak with the supervisor of elections, come forward with our findings, and hopefully have some discussion today that uh, gives further direction on how you want to move forward. So today's agenda uh, is relatively short. Um, and uh, as you know, that uh, th I will go through each of these items with you and start off with just summarizing that my colleague Raphael and I were able to meet or rather speak with each of you, uh, some by phone, some by Zoom, but we were able to have conversation. And then I was also able to have a conversation with Brevard's supervisor of election, Mr. Tim Bobonic. And in each of our conversations with board members, we focused a series of questions on three subject areas. Each member's district specific district, uh, redistricting uh, approach, criteria, and then lastly, public engagement. And um, as you might expect, because I know you've talked about this before, everyone raised different concerns, and particularly when we're talking about individual board members' districts, there's some unique concerns and or characteristics of your districts which we heard about. And then we, we discussed different criteria. And as you would expect, um, different emphasis is placed on different criteria by each board member. So let's take a few minutes, if we can, to talk about redistricting criteria, and also included in this table are some engagement options. And as we move through the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more 
about engagement options. And I want to make clear, we did not ask any board member to place a priority on criteria. What you see here in this table is a summary of what we heard in speaking to board members uh, in terms of whether a board member felt strongly about something or perhaps a particular issue was not even raised by a board member. So you may not see uh, a sum of five as you go across each of these criteria. And that would be because perhaps that particular criteria was just not brought up in conversation. Um, so no surprise to, I think, any of you, there's not a lot of agreement, but I am very happy to say we were able to find one criteria of which everyone agreed on, and that is that no one's ready to move forward with seven board members. So I took that as a positive sign. Um, there was uh, also, uh, not really referenced here, but when we spoke about to what uh, um, every board member uh, acknowledged and understood that balancing overall population is the minimum legal criteria. So I would say that was a point of agreement as well. And then um, because a lot of work has already been done at the county commission, and you've seen in Sue's presentation at your uh, March meeting where that deviation fell for the county commission, which is right hovering at 8.5%, that there was some general uh, consensus that, that that is a reasonable deviation as, as you move forward. Uh, and I know that you've had um, discussion uh, and direction that it needs to come under 10%, and you're now over uh, 10%. There were some other common threads, um, while not necessarily everyone in agreement or the degree of which a board member felt something was important or not important at all, but there were some common threads uh, as, as I think you would expect, and some of those have to do with the distribution of students and also the number of schools across uh, board members' districts, um, diversity within the population and how it portrays itself across each of your districts. Um, obviously, there is consensus from a few of you about county commission boundaries and uh, also some discussion about communities in general. When we move into discussing um, public engagement, there's uh, a, a, some level of uh, agreement that um, the degree to which you move forward with something beyond a board meeting where the public is invited to speak is just part of your normal course of business. Um, I would say that to the degree those of you felt public engagement was important, you did not think in person necessarily was necessary, and that um, uh, virtual could easily accommodate uh, public engagement. We can talk a little bit more about that. I think what we need to talk about in a little bit of detail is the discussion about county commission boundaries. Because that, as you all know, there are several of you that have, that do consider that um, as a strong priority. Um, however, that as a priority does compete or conflict with some of the other priorities that we heard about. So for instance, Moving towards uh, school board member districts matching the county commission boundaries, it does exacerbate the, the imbalance uh, across board member districts for number of schools. So if you're trying to have a somewhat uh, 
equal distribution or equal, uh, as close as you can get to equal distribution, that imbalance does um, become greater under county commission boundaries. Right now, uh, under your, your current boundaries, you have um, the smallest number of schools is 15 in one district and the greater number is, is 19. And so the delta across all the districts is either one, two, three, or four. If you move forward with county commission boundaries, that delta is greater and that deviation between the smallest and the largest is much greater. The, the smallest district would have 12 schools, the largest district would have 21, and that delta across districts is either one, five, or nine. Ms. Sara Lee, you had mentioned this based upon the physical location and address, correct? Not, that, on, the, not on the physical location of students. That is correct, that's right. strictly school location. So in many of our districts, regardless of where they're drawn, students are in our district that go to another school. It's just, you're talking about physical differences. Correct. Okay, uh, we did. Sure. We did, uh, in terms of uh, possible criteria, mm -hmm. um, both students was mentioned as well as student attendance boundaries. And I think part of that is recognizing that distinction between a school may be in an individual board member's district. However, all of the children who are within that attendance boundary may or may not be in that particular sure. board member's district. Thank you, Ms. And I would, I would also uh, say that everyone uh, recognizes that they serve everyone mm -hmm. in your county. Um, I think the issue of number of schools specifically uh, comes down to when a board member wants to get to know their particular school community better, closer, visit the school, uh, get to know the faculty, the administration, the families. Um, it does become more difficult uh, the larger your district is geographically and or the larger number of schools that you have to make regular visits um, in the course of a year. So one of the other areas where um, there is some conflicting uh, priorities between the county commission boundaries is the discussion that we had with some board members about the number of people impacted in moving forward. And, and that did have some relationship to the discussion about public engagement. Ms. Sara Lee, I would, I would go back to where it says one member remains a board member until 2026 but resides out of the district. I think the proposal that had the county commission seat put district five with that district. So they would actually have a district. I'm not sure if you saw that. One of your bullet points inside the presentation is wrapped around a person being outside of their district, but in fact, it drew the district with them in it. They would have a district. I, uh, the intention with this statement, it was from the map that we saw, uh, the board member currently in District 3 would no longer be right. in District 3 if you adopt county commission and the board member that is in district five would not be in district five if you adopt county commission boundaries. They would remain in district five. It would just be that their house is like, if you draw the county commission straight, which was the current one, then that section of where that individual is at would not be inside of it, but we had already prepared to add that person to that district. Does that um, make sense? No, we haven't prepared anything. Her statement is um, absolutely accurate. Ms. It says Ms. Campbell, Ms. Campbell, I, 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 we did have a presentation that put that piece inside of us. I would just, we I would like to give yet, a Mr. second. Susan. No, 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 we made a presentation that included, there is a document that came out that showed that. That's all I'm referring to. That's all I'm referring Are you to. Are talking about these, the maps? Or no? Yeah, no, 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 Ms. <laughs> Hand. We had a presentation earlier that put where we took and carved out so that this all could happen. There would be a district that Ms. Campbell would have. That district is 
it, it's not like she doesn't have a district. It's not like she's just floating out there. There's a literal district that she would be representing. You can't just represent. Hang on, Ms. Just, just hang if, on. If I understood correctly from Mr. Gibbs' memo that Ms. Campbell would remain in her district and the, the boundary adjustment would be timed such that Ms. Campbell was not, Ms. Campbell remained in her district during her term of office. That's what I understood. Right. And, that, that, and in order to do that, that just needed to have a little carve out along there to add her neighborhood to it is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I think we were talking about effective dates of, uh, Mr. Just Gibbs, to, perhaps you yeah, can. Just to clarify, it, it's not a drawing of the line. If you adopt the county lines, they would be the county lines right now. It's just Ms. Campbell would get to finish her term with District 5 and then at the conclusion of her term, she could not run for District 5 anymore. She would have to run for her new district. And Ms. Jenkins would continue to represent District 3 until her term runs, and then she would have to run for District 4. So part of the presentation had showed, and I had had conversations with the supervisor of elections, that, this, that were Ms. Campbell, which I think I've heard that both Ms. Campbell and Ms. Jenkins have mentioned that you guys may not be running again. So that's kind of like a moot point. But the thing is, is that um, both in that you would take that neighborhood, draw it into five until after that individual was no longer present and then move that in. That's in a presentation that I have. Well, we, have we have, I, we have, I, I, Mr. There has Susan. been a presentation that had that inside of it. Well, it was not a presentation that was ever given to this board it, in a public manner. And was. I will tell you, I will tell you right now. No, we've never I, would, I would be careful at saying something that I know to be true, Ms. Campbell, is that our staff presented that piece. So that's okay. It's, it may have been a while ago when it was, but that's what the original presentation was. So. That presentation, that statement, that idea was never presented to this board. And I, you don't want me uh, to challenge Ms. you. I'm, I'm, Mr. Mr. Susan, I'd like to finish. I, I there's know, I not been a conversation. Off, there's so. not been a conversation about a carve out and I, about my neighborhood, uh, my neighborhood, because I will tell you, my precinct is the second largest precinct in the no. entire in the entire county. It's got 12,000 voters in it. And if you move my precinct into any other precinct, You're not you just threw off the whole, whole entire percentage. Nobody said just now that you would be, that that would be the way it is. There was another option that gave it to where you would have a, nobody's taking an entire precinct and moving it into somewhere else. Your precinct is larger than your neighborhood, Ms. Campbell. I would yes. say with this, for the presence of it, that there is an option that makes it to where you have a district until you decide not to. We've run. already talked about that. That we, you, the, the that possibility legally, if we do, it if is we, legal. If we adopt, right? But that's not. We talked about my neighborhood. Uh, what the, the statement that she put here is correct. No. The president, you you were doubting the st the veracity of her statement, which is one board member, which would be me, remains a board member until 2026, but resides out of district. If we adopt the county commission lines, I will for three and a half years be residing outside of District Five, regardless of you can't just move a neighborhood and say yes, you can. for this. No, you can't. I'm just not going to continue to argue yes, with you. Yes, you can. So there was two options on the table. You could do it that way, or you could take a neighborhood and carve it out and put it there. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. And that is in documents that we did receive because I think that was part of the conversation. And I had the conversation with the, the supervisor of elections. And it is completely legal. I've also legal. had a conversation with the supervisor I, of elections. I understand. That is not what he said to me. Well, it, what I talked to about the supervisor and what you talked to, I hope would be two to separate things. But it is legal to do. And he said that as soon as what the corrective action would be, she could have that district. And then as soon as that her, she is not going to run or she is no longer on the ballot, you can readjust it or you can keep it the same way. It's not a big deal. That's all. Okay, my turn. So I'm going to go ahead and back up uh, Ms. Campbell's claims. Uh, maps in which there was a carve out for Ms. Campbell were not presented to oh the board. God. I also find it interesting that there would be a map that carves out Ms. Campbell and not Ms. Jenkins. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and as well, no, you cannot draw out Ms. Campbell's neighborhood because then you would be causing the problems you claim you're trying to avoid with the supervisor of elections. You have to carve out the entire precinct. Otherwise, you're going to create new problems for the supervisor of elections. The point that I was told or that was presented to this board, the reason we wanted to adopt the county commission lines was to reduce voter confusion. So if we adopt the lines but then deviate them slightly, we're not reducing voter confusion. We'll still have the same exact voter confusion. 
So I think the confusion that you may have is, is that you and I are up for election, right? So that our districts can align because then we are in the same election. But Ms. Campbell needed that extra time. So when I spoke to the supervisor of elections, mm -hmm. he stated that this was an option. That's all. So I just didn't want it to be that this is the reason that you can't go this route or anything like that. So that's I'm all. Not, that, I'm that's, to that's it. I'm allowed to say the conversation I had with the supervisor, we, we and that's what you, it is. We heard you, Mr. Susan, but well, I'm, I'm not confused. I'm not confused at all um, because it wouldn't make sense why you would carve out one board member and not another. I don't want to be carved out. I'm not advocating for that. Uh, but the fact that you're having that conversation is very odd. So no, I'm not confused, but it wasn't something that was presented to okay. this board. Okay, all right, Ms. Jenkins. The floor is you, Ms. Sarah Lee. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think as we move uh, towards the end of the presentation and we talk about possible scopes, uh, I believe that uh, your suggestion uh, Mr. Chair, comes into play. This slide is intended to discuss solely an exact adoption of the county commission boundaries okay. as they exist today. Um, Good point. And uh, what uh, potential implications would be. And I, I just call your attention to this map uh, that is on this slide. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, down here in Florida, I think part of the confusion we run into with our constituents is many have not been born and raised in Florida and, in fact, have come to us from somewhere else, often up north, and they are not used to having a, an autonomous school board and an autonomous county council. They're actually used yeah. to their town, their community, uh, having authority over their schools. And so I think part of the confusion we all run into when we're speaking with constituents is um, they, they are surprised that the school board is an autonomous entity here in Florida with its own operation. And then certainly when they're looking at a voter ID card, and it says County Commission, District 3, School Board Commission, District 4, or whatever, you know, it is a reasonable question in their mind, why are they not the same? If, if they're both the whole county, why are they not the same? I will say you are not the only district slash county that does not match your school board seats with your county commission seats. Um, we did not do a survey of everyone, but I know just as a matter of uh, my own experience uh, working on this issue with, with others that they may not have matched historically or they may have matched historically and they do not now. And for whatever reason, it's often because the school board um, reasonably so, is concerned about different issues than the county commission. They may oftentimes work on issues together, but your first and foremost obligation is to the operation of your schools. And um, we all know that our schools come in uh, very, very helpful to the county when there's storms. Um, and that there's often a lot of other issues we work on together, but it is not unusual for them not to match and or for you to decide to match them and or later choose not to. Um, I think the areas that you can see on this map are the areas that would be impacted if you decide to go to a straight county commission boundary adoption. These are the geographic areas uh, where people will be impacted uh, in speaking with uh, Mr. Bobonic about that. Uh, right now, Brevard has in excess of 460,000 registered voters. Unfortunately, we know that not everybody votes. Um, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 voters 
in these different colored areas. Um, so let's talk uh, a little bit about um, our conversation with the supervisor of elections. And I want to make sure I clarify, um, especially this first and second bullet. This first bullet is actually speaking to what if you decide to adopt the county commission boundaries to be your school board seats. If you do that, you do reduce the uh, number of ballot types. You don't necessarily change the number of ballots because whatever your number of voters are, each voter has to have a ballot. Um, but this, this bullet is speaking specifically to if you choose to adopt county commission boundaries. If you choose to adopt some other variation, and we don't know what that would be, uh, the number of ballot types may go up, um, probably wouldn't go down, may go up a lot, may not go up a lot. That is when this issue of looking at the precincts uh, and if moving a whole precinct is not possible, a precinct may be too large, um, then again, in conversation with Mr. Babonic, at the very least, do not uh, take any geographic unit that is smaller than the census block as determined by the US Census. Um, so there's different issues that are raised um, depending on uh, you know, how you decide to look at your boundaries. Uh, certainly if, if we become engaged with you to move this forward in uh, uh, whatever manner is decided, we would be working closely with the supervisor of election on whatever um, scenarios were created because uh, it is important to try and keep things as, um, as, as simple as possible, whether we're looking at the shapes of the, the districts or whether we're looking at um, where people are voting and the formation of precincts. Um, the supervisor of election is required to send out voter cards after you adopt um, whatever you choose to adopt. He will have to send out new voter cards to any voter that is affected. So meaning, if, if a current voter stays in District 1 and his or her um, nothing is changed, that particular voter does not need a card. But if a voter is reassigned to a different uh, district, then that voter would have to get a card. Um, and again, uh, he, they, their office, uh, they have some good staff. Uh, they review their precincts and their data regularly. Uh, and certainly if we were part of your team moving forward, we would be continuing to have conversation and work with Mr. Bobonic and his staff. Uh, lastly, before we uh, move into some conversation about potential scopes, I um, wanted to just talk about public engagement. And uh, uh, many of you said an extensive process is not necessary. But again, some competing priorities. You know, if we're going to impact a lot of people, then the need for engagement becomes greater. Um, if um, um, what form that engagement takes, recognizing this work is going to happen quickly and over the summer. So being able to reach out to people through their schools is not necessarily an option. Um, and people will be away, as people normally are, during the summer. Um, we did speak with each of you uh, about a web tool that WXY has used in other redistricting um, exercises, not specifically school board redistricting, but I know you're very familiar with attendance boundaries. And that web tool is able to um, be made accessible um, virtually for people to comment on 
and or um, to conduct some virtual meetings. So um, again, the whole discussion about public engagement, the level to which uh, any one of you were interested in it kind of corresponded to other concerns that um, you may or may not have, have raised. Uh, at this point, I am going to turn the uh, next two slides over to Adam and Raphael to talk to you about potential scopes uh, should you decide that you want to do something beyond just adopting county commission boundaries. Super, thank you thoroughly. So we've put together two scope options based on what we heard. The both scopes recommend an analysis of the county commission boundaries and a first scenario which explores the minimum number of changes to your existing school board boundaries that you might need to make in order relations. And that would be to minimally balance the populations to get under that 10% threshold. The analysis of the county commission boundaries would be purely to calculate the same set of metrics that we'd be calculating for the county commission boundaries so that in effect you'd be able to compare apples to apples the county commission boundaries against the scenario one boundaries. Under option two, we recommend exploring a second scenario. And this is really a much more open-ended scenario where we could explore different member priorities and make more significant boundary changes. And so if you're interested in this, this uh, we, we haven't prescribed or recommended an approach for the second scenario, but that would be determined based on, on additional board input. In both scenarios, we recommend a board workshop and a round of boundary edits following the board workshop. And that would lead to a final set of scenario boundary recommendations. We recommend different levels of engagement under the two scopes. In both scopes, we recommend an interactive mapping tool. However, only in option two are we recommending virtual meetings based on your And then both options include reporting, and that's just a final report as well as a summary of the engagement. The engagement summary would be different in the two options. So in the first option, it would just be a set of metrics who submitted a survey on the interactive tool, who put a comment on the map, what was the web traffic like. Under option two, it would include all of that website data in addition to data collected at the meetings. Because option one is less work overall, the fee is lower and the timeline is shorter. And so we believe that rounding out the analysis by the end of June would be appropriate, leaving plenty of time um, ahead of August 22nd, which as I understand is the latest possible date that boundaries can be adopted to go into effect um, for the next election. Option in terms of timeline, we think that it's reasonable to complete all of the option two tasks by the end of July this summer with the same um, note later than date. Uh, and then the fee amounts are, are different and based at the bottom there. I wanna note that um, these are just two sets of options we've put together. We can sort of mix and match uh, tasks as necessary if, if the board is interested and um, can provide uh, updated the estimates uh, based on these different con configurations. Slide, please. Um, so we're just quickly touching on the timeline again before kicking it off to Q&A. 
Um, so we recommend um, under both options to complete the redistricting analysis in May. The board workshop would then take place at one of the listed dates. The round of modifications, if needed, uh, would take place after that board workshop. We're recommending that engagement take place in June and or July, depending on the amount of the engagement done under or um, how the board would want to proceed on engagement. We're recommending that the initial scenario is published to the web tool for public comment, so that the board would then have access to public comments as they're at their board workshop. Following the board workshop and the round of edits, that revised scenario, if the scenario is revised, would then be re-uploaded to the web tool and members of the public would be able to leave comments um, on that updated scenario. And under option two, in the time we would uh, additionally be conducting virtual meetings. Um, and then finally, the final redistricting and engagement memo once the redistricting and engagement tests are complete. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Sarah Lee. That concludes the information that we've put together for your consideration. And um, obviously, if, if you need any elaboration or answering any questions uh, during your discussion, we're, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, you guys did a great pre presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, with that, are there any board members that wish to discuss any of this? I, I do know that one of the things that would help with whether we went with the county commission or not, I spent a lot of time looking at our current ones and the county commission ones. And if you do it by population, um, there's schools like McNair, Saturn, Golfview that are physical locations in one, but the majority of students may be in the other. So you may be able to say, in order to equal it out, you can take those schools and regardless of if we went with the county commission or not, the population inhibits you to do that. Like for me, there's a lot of kids that are in my district that go to Anderson, but I think that it's in your district, right? So it's, there's like that whole dynamic, right? So there's the way to levelize all of the schools is in some cases, and I went across and it's probably three or four that we would have to do that on, but the majority of them would fall into the districts that we have currently. Um, I just wanted to kind of mention that as we were moving forward, but if you guys want to start the conversations, any kind of the direction or anything like that? I'll, I'll start the conversation. So this is, um, redistricting is obviously one of those topics that people feel differently and different passions about this because it impacts us all differently. Uh, and it's one of those challenging things that we have to, to take on because statute says that we have to do this. Um, one of the other things to take in consideration, which I hope maybe our legislators will look at this in the future, but uh, our districts, based on the number of voters, doesn't necessarily correlate to the number of students. So when you have a retirement community that's in a district, now that number goes up. And so I understand the complexity of this. This is, it's a complicated issue. Um, to me, I've said this since day one, I really feel like adopting the county commissions is the same, we should keep it the same, just for simplicity of voters. That's what I've said since day one. I understand it poses challenges to really three of you guys. I don't think, well, no, actually everyone except for mine. Mine's the only district I think that doesn't really get impacted by this uh, change too much. So that's where I stand on this. I don't know where you guys stand on this, but I guess that's what we will discuss at this point. <laughs> don't, don't everybody all jump at once. All right. Um, yeah, I, I think it's um, uh, well. Thank you very much for doing what you did, and taking the time, and, and uh, how to wrap that up to say that we all are independently thinking about this. Um, you said that nicely. Uh, same here. I've said it from the very beginning. Um, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There are going to be positives and negatives. We could sit here for for many many months coming up with. Uh, scenarios and you know a couple years from now I, I don't think we're going to look back and um, say I wish we would have did the boundaries in a different way I mean when we're all off the board it'll just be new people and uh, uh, regardless of where we live so 
uh, I'm with Megan on this. I, I just, uh, I just, I'm just, I don't want to spend any any of the district's money if we don't have to. And um, you know, I'm all for the uh, uh, the county commission boundaries. They've already taken the time and the effort and, and spent the money. So that's where I've been since day one as well. Thank you, Mr. Trent. Ms. Jenkins. <coughs> So you're right. Um, it's not about the board members individually because they aren't permanent. Um, but it is about our students, our staff, and the communities in which we represent. And adopting the county commission map doesn't make that a priority. Uh, it's clear. <laughs> it's evident. When one district will have 21 schools, seven of which are secondary schools, and another district would be left with 12. Um, that's not in the best interest of students and staff. I <laughs> have the least amount of um, personal buy-in for this conversation because whether or not we adopt the county commission or completely redraw this map, the likelihood of me staying in District 3 is basically impossible. So my perspective is completely unselfish. <laughs> Um, I believe it's our role and responsibility to do what's best for our students, our staff, and the communities that we serve. What I've found interesting from day one of this conversation is that we forget the part where the county commissioners have the opportunity and the authority to draw the maps in which we're looking at right now. And so essentially, by adopting their maps, you're relinquishing your control and your responsibility and authority that you were given by the voters who voted you in to make that decision. I'm not comfortable with that either. Their role and responsibility is very different than ours. The reason they drew their maps was for their own purposes and their roles in representing the counties and the areas that they were voted into. So that makes no sense to me. Personally, I think that if we're going to redraw the map, it needs to have significant changes to it. Districts three, four, and five are way larger than one and two. Districts four and five are proposed to continue to grow. There's no reason to not look at this completely differently. Again, an unselfish conversation because I will very much be drawn out of my district. <laughs> um, I think disenfranchising 100,000 voters to not be able to vote in the next election that they were expecting to vote in um, is unfortunate. Um, I think, I'm just gonna tell it like it is, I think having a conversation in the beginning of this where we talk about cutting in one board member and not another just shows where your priorities lie. If you adopt those county commission maps, I. I hope you expect to have a very packed room of angry people, because that's what's gonna happen. Because you're not representing the constituents within the, within the entire county. Um, I think it's a self-serving decision. I'm completely against it. Again, I have no personal buy-in. Quite frankly, I would love to be in another district to vote against somebody. I think this is just, I think this is foolish. I think we're relinquishing our role and responsibility and I don't think we're doing what's in the best interest of our students and our staff. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Ms. Campbell. Sure, I've got a couple questions before I make my comments. Um, I have on the slide, I guess it's the last slide with the information. There was a, and on the timeline, there was mention of adopting the resolution no later than August 22nd. Is there, I know in my conversations with you, I had shared my personal feelings that I want to go ahead and get this done by the Simer for potential candidates, just out of fairness, because that gives them exactly one year before their election. So I don't know if that was what the thought, because I don't think we're, I think our actual statutory limitations are this calendar year, odd, odd year. Is that, that's correct, right? Okay. So it's not necessarily, the adoption of the resolution by August 22nd is not necessarily a, a mandate. It's just a, a goal. Correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, and then I, you know, so just 
sharing different thoughts. You had said something about, um, in the conversation with Mr. Bobanek, uh, about the new voter cards. I don't know about the rest of the board members, but I get a new voter registration card every single year, regardless if anything changes or not. They just send them out fresh and new every year, and I cut it out, put it in my wallet, throw the other one away. Um, it's just something that they have done routinely, unless they're making a change. I think they do that all the time. I also wonder, I personally, my preference between the two options would be option one. Um, I, you know, it, it is, $17,000 difference, but it is $17,000. Um, and I think that we could, you know, looking at, it gets the job done. The things that it doesn't do is the sig more significant boundary changes. I disagree, Ms. Jenkins, respectfully, with the making bigger changes, because my priority is for us to make as few changes as possible, and I'll go on with that in just a minute. Um, and then I, I, like, I like that we have interactive interactive mapping tool, but I think what we miss in having the virtual meetings, I think that is something we could do in-house if we had to, maybe not with the same level of expertise, but we could facilitate something like that if we, you know, if we were in a tight. Um, so I, I will be quite honest with you guys, it, the only, there was only one board member, because we had this conversation two years ago, that it was absolutely clear that from day one that this was his position, because he's been very clear from day one. But I'll be honest, I have yet to hear a really solid reason for making this drastic change. This is a drastic change. The people, the only people who I've ever heard complain, and I, you know, I've just been on the board for four and a half years, ran two campaigns. Um, the only people who I ever hear complain about us not being aligned are people from Breck. And you know, for people who are actively campaigning, because most of the people, that's the Brevard Republican Executive Committee, for those who are not aware, for, political terminology, the, the, and not even all of them. And when they've said, why can't it be, it would be easier, for campaigning it would be easier. But that's not our goal, is to make it easier for campaigning. Um, our, I don't, you know, even if we have different goals, I don't think that, I haven't heard that spoken as any of our goals. And when I have shared with them what it would mean as far as the number of voters who would not get to vote in the next election, who thought they were going to, being 42,000, it wasn't 100,000, it was, it's a total number of, of disruption, but it's only 42,000 that would not get to vote in the next election, um, who were supposed to, in other, if we had not made any changes. That, that makes a difference to them. And it makes a difference to me. And I, I do have a problem. I mean, I, I know Mr. Gibbs, I'm gonna trust him. I know he's shared us with that, you know, that we can do, we can draw the lines and draw the lines with me outside of District 5. I still don't like it. It's not about me running again. I still don't like the idea of, of representing people. Um, and I certainly, my, one of my things that I have said from day one is to make the, is to not, um, create any new precincts to move, make the changes we move precinct by precinct, if at all possible, and I think that's what they've suggested that we could do. Don't want to have to create new precincts, split new precincts, put, some, put them together. And when I had my conversation with Mr. Ban Bobanek, he, uh, with those the things we talked about, and by the way, he said, I, I thank you guys for reaching out to him, he said he'd be willing to come and talk to us as well, so we can clear up conversation you had with him and she had with him and I had with him. So we are all on the same page and, and clearly having this conversation regardless of what we decide to do. Um, you know, one of us said something about reinventing the wheel. Exactly. I don't want us to reinvent the wheel. Changing our school board boundaries to match the county commissioners, we are reinventing this wheel. We are recreating, we are making major drastic changes. And I just, if I say about the same thing multiple ways, I'm sorry, I, on, you know, and I apologize if sometimes when we get on this issue, I, I seem like a little bit of a Tasmanian devil. On the inside, I am feeling a little Tasmanian devil because I, to me, we're making huge changes with something that is very close to being how it needs to be. We have really great population, when we had the conversation, I very much appreciated it, when we had these conversations and the priorities, uh, you know, uh, it was asked of me uh, by Annalie, you know, you know, what do you think about your community? I'm like, you know what, when I look at my community and the community of every district, I see that balanced population. I see in every district a, some areas of affluence and some areas of poverty, some Title I schools and some non-Title I areas. I see, you know, just the, the difference 
you know, we have a really great balance right now. And so making minimal changes to that leaves us with that good balance and won't create those districts that have a larger population of people who don't have families, people don't have kids. Um, and so we're, and that, that affects your voting population, you know, and all of that. So, and I also don't think, we're not talking about many, many months. I mean, unless you're, you, we're not ready to make this decision today. So regardless, I mean, if, if the majority of the board kind of sounds like we're going there, they've already made up their mind, then you could put it on the ballot at the next board meeting and let's just say we're doing it, we're adopting the kind of commission lines. So we won't spend even $57,000. We won't do, we don't need to do public engagement. Public engagement is if they want to sign up for public comment, they can do that. If y'all are ready to do that, then roll and we'll, we'll do it. But I, I don't think... But even if we don't do that, even if we walk through this process, we're not talking about many months. We're talking about, today is April 25th. We're talking about less than four, right at four months of a process. And could be even faster if we do the option one and we're done by June and then we get it rolled, we do adopt the resolution by July. I mean, we're, it doesn't have to, which, so we're talking about three months. There's no reason that, you know, to say that it's many months. And this, adopting the county commission lines, I'm gonna say again, is not the simplest option. It's not. 42,000 people, I'm gonna say it one more time, 42,000 people who, were, who are in District 3 or 4 who would be moved out of District 3 or 4, and we're gonna have some. We can't do this without moving some people. But I would prefer a plan where we're moving a little precinct here, a little precinct there to make us even, to make us within the, in the percentages, but then we've only moved a couple of thousand people out of the next election. We can't avoid it all. And I will commit to you, if we'll go through this process, I'm not gonna cherry pick which precinct and say, no, I really want that precinct, and no, I really want, no, I, I'm willing to be fair about it. But I think we need to keep this, to me, simple is just do what the county commission did. Moved one precinct, two precinct, we can't get away with one because the ways ours are drawn, but move one or two, three at the max, just do the, the, what we can do to get it even, but to disrupt as few voters as possible, to disrupt the balance that we currently have of, to me, really well demographically defined districts. I hope that you all took advantage. I asked Tammy to look up the last two rounds, and I hope you guys took advantage of that and read through those notes, because what I saw, even down to 2001, um, Unfortunately, the minutes stopped in October, but where they stopped in October was they were working with the county commission to redraw the lines, and in October they said, mm, we're not doing that anymore. And I had a conversation with Janice Kershaw, um, who was in my seat at the time, and uh, she didn't really remember a lot of the details of it, but they, for them it came down to schools. And then if you look at uh, 2011, they considered it again. They considered, could we, could we go with the county commission lines? And they didn't. They actually made really pretty good sized changes um, because they were, like 34 percentage points out of compliance. Um, so we're definitely not sitting there. So they made some pretty big changes and had a lot of uh, community feedback. Um, but, you know, again, they got it done without going, with, even though the option was available to them of matching the county commission lines. Go back and read through the minutes and um, you'll see they, they chose not to do that. And again, it, part of it is the different purposes that we have. We don't really all have to touch the beach. We don't really all have to touch the Indian River Lagoon because we don't take, we don't, those aren't our kind of issues. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, I proposed this two years ago unselfishly. We were in a situation where mm -hmm. the county commission had reached out and asked during that time, are you guys gonna get moving on your redistricting, okay? And what ended up happening is, is that we were in a situation where our, I brought it up and said, there's two options here. We can do an accelerated redistricting just along the same number of times that you just had spoken to. But the main thing was, is if we just mirrored the county commission, this thing could be fixed. So we were out of compliance. At that time, Mr. Bobonic had been sending emails over to us asking us to redistrict because of the situation that he had. He was... He had expressed his discontent with our district because of the behavior of us not responding to him and not going back. So what I had proposed was an unselfish two years ago, let's move forward with something, and this board decided not to. Um, that meant that for the next two years, we were out of compliance. 
The next thing is, is that I hear over and over again this thing that we can't support students because the physical location of the school is not in our, in our thing. Statutory law says that we have to follow all students to be represented, not just where the location of the school is at. So when I sit there and I drive around and I knock on doors and it's in Rockledge and the students go to Anderson and the same confusion, which I will tell you, many people along the campaign trail, along the times that I'm knocking on doors, do say to me, how is it? And the reason is, is that my district, I think, is the most impacted. So I have, I think, every single county difference of county commission in my district. So the bottom line is, is that when I'm knocking on doors, I see it a lot where people say, well, I thought I was in school board district four or district three because of what I have for the county commission. The other thing that I would say is, is that our schools, we have representation. I already, I already went through it. You can move McNair, Saturn, Gulfview over to district one. You can move Sable, Croton over to district three. There's all kinds of options where the majority of students are inside another district where the physical location of the school is in another. So if it's the schools, which is not even by statute that we're supposed to do it that way, is the, con is the part, then doing it that way evens it out, and we can get to a more equal position doing that. To say that we're going to sit here and draw the districts based on the physical location of the schools is impossible. Because the bottom line is, is that Gene, ha Mr. Trent has so many, I have many, it, it would be literally work over work over work to try to get there. So we're gonna have to go to a place where we just literally sit back and say, okay, the majority of students here or some of the students there and we just equal it out. And I will tell you that we can represent a school because not because the physical location is inside of our district, but the actual students are there. And just the simple fact that I've seen all of you go around and actually represent many of the other schools in many different ways in a positive thing. So I have, I have the belief that you guys can do that. Going on to cleaning up the districts, there seems to be this, the precincts, there seems to be this thing where Mr. Bobonic is saying one thing. Look, he has come forward and said, if I asked you guys two years ago to do this, there's emails that were sent, you didn't do it. No matter what you do, we're gonna to have to impact people. So whether we do it with the county commission or we do it minimally or we do it like Ms. Jenkins said majorly, those people are gonna be represented. He's going to have to send out the cards. That's just what's gonna happen and it was part of the presentation over here. So we're gonna impact people no matter what. So the argument isn't that we're not gonna impact people, it's just maybe we impact less people if we go the other way. So. The other c component is, is that this increased costs at a time where we're trying to reallocate towards different priorities, we're also gonna be increasing staff time. Because if we go with the county commission, then the staff time gets sent up. And, I mean, there's no doubt that we have currently policies that we can't even get to right now that are out of compliance. We have a new superintendent coming. We have a new super strategic plan coming. We have a huge amount of, um, situation where we're gonna be going through the budget, which all of those meetings that she had put down on there are gonna be allocated towards the budget. We've only gone through 2,000 out of the 9,000. We have literally so much stuff to do that this is gonna impact it. So from a cost perspective, from staff's times perspective, from the impact inside the community, from I, I would say that this is the best case scenario. I would also wanna make the argument that there are many counties across the state that have this that match the county commissions. There are many that don't. That is a moot point. And where we draw our lines does not make a difference of if we represent kids. I have many schools that I represent the kids that aren't inside my district. So anyways, with that, I think that there's a majority that move towards I, that. I would like to have a second round of discussion, please, if you wouldn't mind. Ms. Ms. Campbell, then please, when we come to the 2000 um, proposals, don't try to say we don't have enough time for the, the rest of the board meeting. Mr. Susan. I, I just like, we are equally there's three officials. people that have given. We just took yeah, the but there are three people. This meeting going no, on a no. Ms. no. Ms. Campbell has a right to turn. speak. Ms. I, Ms. Jenkins, Ms. Jenkins. I don't please. like to be dismissed by any side. Nobody okay. does. Nobody well, does. But I, I rather I than asked, wrap it up tight because you, you've okay. got it wrapped up with a bow, you get to go around first round. We can have a second round. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Because you brought up some new issues, 
And you addressed some of the issues that I've addressed or other people have addressed, but you haven't addressed all of them. You brought something up new and talked about two years ago. So I would like to share two years ago, which will be in the minutes, it will be on the video with the conversations that we had. Yes, we had the opportunity to, two years ago to have this conversation. It was presented by Ms. Han at the last board meeting that the census data did not come out until late. The county commissioners got a late start with their very long process. And what I recall you asking us to do was to say, absolutely what you said, let's just go along with whatever the county commissioners do but at that point it was going to be going along blindly because they were in the process they didn't know what they were doing they did not vote on what they were going to do until November and I as a board member who was on the board with you at the time was not willing to say yes to whatever the county commissioners do not knowing what they're going to do I was not willing to do that and by the time we had the decision that they had made in November, we had from November to December with a Christmas break and a Thanksgiving break in there to make, to go through this process and to see, and to do our own process, which does not have to be as long and complicated. But then we were short on time. We and we couldn't, and we couldn't control that. And I was not, I'm not going to blindly say yes to what another entity is going to do, not having any idea how it's going to affect us. I'm not going to say yes ahead of time and write them a blank check for a decision that is our job to make. So I'm just going to clarify that. Yes, you brought it up, and you've said that many, many times. You brought it up. We're out of compliance. We were out of compliance this much. They were out of compliance that much. They got their job done but we did not have time. And our general counsel told us at the time we were close enough to deal with it and we would push it off to 2023 because that was the next opportunity that we had. We've talked about cost increases. I hear you, I hear you. But we're talking about $57,000. So unless you've got another cost increase because the supervisor of elections in having conversation with our consultants has explained it is not an increased cost to them unless we do something like create new precincts. They have to print all the same things. So we're not talking about extra increase. And when we talk about too much work to do, I hear you, Mr. Susan. I am tired. I'm exhausted. And I know I'm looking at the next few months. And I know we've got so much work to do. And I am committed to do it. And I will get up early and stay up late and do whatever I have to do to get it done. But I'm not going to dismiss this as an issue that's not as important because we can just so quickly and glibly take care of it. I, 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 am, I am opposed to this. I believe there are people when they realize who, who they are that will be affected will be opposed to this and I hope they speak up. If this is what happens, I will, once the decision is made, go along. And the schools, yes, I would like to have an even number of schools. I hear you, we can be creative and yes, we represent all schools and I think I have done a pretty good job of that myself too. But we're talking that you have not answered to me the big issue of the number of voters who we're shoving out of an election you have not addressed that. Are you finished? Yes, I am. Um, I didn't mean that really. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, so, so first and foremost, uh, Mr. Bobanek wasn't the supervisor of elections two years ago. Just want to make sure that that is clear. Um, I also spoke with him, and it appears that my conversation was very similar to Ms. Campbell's. And again, when I specifically asked him, how would this make things easier for the supervisor of elections? He said, well, it's possible that we might be able to reduce the number of precincts, but I don't know how many precincts would even be impacted. I don't even know if we've got that response yet. It may be the most minimal number. He doesn't know. He said that very transparently. He also told me that you, had articulated that one board member would be displaced. So if we're gonna have this conversation, let's be transparent from the get-go. From the get-go, have some integrity. We know where you're coming from. I understand the intention. One thing that's really important for the community to realize that we have not discussed publicly is Mr. Gibbs did send us a memo that said, sure, we can reside out of our districts, um, but that opens us up to a financial liability of constituents suing the school board for the two members being out of their area. Oh so Mr. Gibbs, because I'm sure that'll be magically refuted for accuracy, can you please speak to that? Yeah, I had mentioned that there is a possibility that someone could try and challenge a board member being out of their district. The law is pretty clear that uh, the board member would get to serve out their elected term. So 
we would have to defend the lawsuit, so there would be a financial impact to the district should someone sue the district. But uh, I, I'm not overly concerned with the result of that lawsuit. Right. So the law is very clear, but that doesn't stop in a politically divisive environment from constituents doing that, in which you will then take on the burden and cost of that lawsuit. Just want to make that clear to the public. That's your taxpayer money that we're risking. Um, you know, there was conversations about uh, the schools don't matter, we could represent them all, <coughs> yada, yada, yada. But county commission lines also that. don't take into effect attendance boundaries either. So, I mean, that's not a thing. Nobody, nobody's talking about trying to get the voters and the students to live within your area that also go to the school. That's, that's like virtually impossible. What it means is to have a balance of schools in which those staff and parents and communities can reach out to and establish an easy, consistent connection with. That's all that that means. It doesn't have to do with the voters literally living inside of your district. And I think that's a really reasonable concept and request. I think that's what you're going to hear from the people who are potentially going to be displaced by a decision of adopting the county commission lines. The increase of staff time, no. That's the point of hiring potentially an outside consultant agency. Ms. Han, when she met with us individually, I would assume she had the same conversation with everyone, not just with me, requested and recommended that it go outside of the district to not increase staff time. So that, that shouldn't be a concern at all. Um, and again, the increase of cost. This is a drop in the, in the bucket of our budget. This is the responsibility that we have statutorily to our constituents and the taxpayers who fund our budget. Um, and again, if you have someone bring a lawsuit to those two districts, you're going to eat that cost instantly. All right, thank you. Ms. Hahn, I think you have a majority of individuals that want to move forward with the county commission seats. So with that, what would you like us to do? Yes, sir, the, the only question I have remaining is um, I was contemplating a public engagement process similar to what we did with the attendance boundaries where we have a QR code and access on the website to a Google document where people can comment and then we would provide that to the board at the time of adoption um, looking at either May 30th or June 13th. Do you have a preference? So we make the action, you, can, you would bring it forward on May 30th? Yes, sir. I think I think May 30th would be the correct time. And the issue that we have is is that we're going to be let's talk about how that communication goes out. You know what I mean? So Can go I, ahead. I I just wanted to get a chance to speak back for one second in regards to some of the things that were said. So yeah. um, Ms. Campbell, one of the things that, and I guess I haven't clearly conveyed this. Um, the reason that I like the county commissioner's plan so much is that there is room for variance for growth. It gets us well below that 10% mark that we're supposed to be at. It's 8.5, but I mean, it, it gets us below it. So there is room for growth with it. Um, and I don't know, I guess I didn't ac accurately convey that to you. Um, one of the other things I guess that was said was in regards to the amount of voters, which I, you, you took care of that. It's not 100,000 voters, it's 40 something thousand voters that it potentially impacts. But again, of those voters, um, I would love to see all 40,000 of them vote in an election, but, but they don't. Um, that's the reality when it comes to things that are you know school board related usually. Um, so again, this, to me, I think it makes the most sense, but I understand why you guys feel differently about it. Um, I'm just telling you that's where I'm at with it. All right. Thank you very much. Next work session is on board policy 3500 remote work. Mm. Yes, sir, thank you. The board had asked us to accelerate that and uh, Ms. Green has done so. And uh, if you have some, any comments or uh, questions I can't about tell you how excited I am about this. This is a <laughs> argument in my private side that we fight all the time and I don't like it there, but I really like it here. <laughs> so we believe it's going to be good for the district as well. So yeah. Thank you. Do you need a microphone? She does. Yeah, I think Mr. Karen, Broom's can you, coming uh, up. Can you on step this. aside and let uh, Dr. Oh, got it. Thank you. Mr. Susan, Ms. Hand board. Um, at the request of the board, we have uh, fast tracked our remote work policy. This particular policy is not required by any Florida statute, but by um, the av availability and the things we're able to do now in the remote world. Uh, we have had a pilot over the last year that has been implemented um, 
in our educational technology department. And uh, the, the pilot, um, this is a, a policy that um, they have been working on for a year, so we have a little bit of background and, and work behind us. And in this policy, you find the forms that are required, the approval processes that are required, and the eligibility list for the non-bargaining personnel that are um, eligible for the remote work. It follows the NEOLA templates, and the um, administrative procedures are uh, Brevard's implementation processes. Thank you, Ms. Green. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this topic? say thank you um, I think you probably were in the room when I was having these conversations over and over again um, about how important I think this is for us to um, modify and change the way we look at some of our positions here at BPS um, in order to keep up with the ever-growing changing environment in the industry around us that is pulling our staff members and making it more and more difficult for us to <clears throat> recruit and uh, retain our staff members so thank you for working on this so quickly i appreciate it thank you um thank you dr green i just wanted to make one request because i didn't see this job description specifically down at the bottom you had a list of the employees who are or are not eligible yeah. can you please make sure the administrative assistant to the board is included in those who are eligible it, it was uh, a new list was uploaded this morning okay. we had missed some people in the mostly vacant positions and so we have cleaned that up and she was the first one who noticed that <laughs> <laughs> she's looking for her name so All right. i think she uploaded that this morning awesome thank you <laughs> Oh, I see it right there. It's number two. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. Uh, Mr. Trent. Now again, I just think it's catching up the times and uh, yep. thank you for the work. I hope we use this as a marketing tool because I think this will actually <coughs> attract will. Yeah. Some, some people to our we district will. That, that will look at this and say, hey, a remote opportunity to work is something that they're interested in. So I'm I excited about you, this. I tell you, Mr. Cheatham is just waiting for that opportunity. Yeah, IT is like, yes, <laughs> so they're cheering us on. So we're excited about this. Thank you so much. And I think I, I, uh, the sentiment of the board members, uh, IT was specifically losing people in yeah. interviews because other companies are going remote. And there's a couple people that are pretty high up in our organization that we're going to possibly go to another place because of based upon this. So I, I'm really proud moving forward. I thank the pilot group. I thank all of your work, Ms. Green. I think that this is a great thing. So thank you very much. I think we're all in positive support. So yeah. move forth and do great things, right? Um, next session, work session is board policy 5511, dressing and grooming. Yes, sir. Um Mr. Gibbs had sent some additional information out to board members, some survey results as requested by the board. I think we're ready to discuss that. Uh, Dr. Brebley was not able to be here with us today, but we'll do our best to try to respond to questions if uh, Dr. Cody uh, would mind joining us at the table. I think the, um, everybody's aware, and maybe the public's not, that there was a survey that went out to our students, mm -hmm. and it came back with a lot of responses. Yes. I think that that was a great idea. Um, uh, in the process of doing this. I think my concern has always been that we we're able to do this ahead of the, the next year and it's been indicated from staff that we definitely can take this in like we should and move forward. I think even though the students are not part of our policy or our, our voter group, they are our voter group. Like so are they're part of our demographics and we should listen to them as much as possible. So um, great idea. Um, I open the floor for conversation. Ms. Jenkins, do you want to go first? Do you, are you guys presenting anything or I mean I think I, I don't think we're prepared to present anything right. in Dr. Webley's absence so That's what I thought. you have yeah, some comments we'll follow down. up I feel like we had a healthy conversation last time mm -hmm. I think it was pretty yep fair. yep Ms. Campbell um, around. okay Mr. Trent no I just want to hear what they have to say yeah, we're good. Ms. So Jenkins I, 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 I'm Ms. Brighton oh I, I'm sorry I was gonna say I was, <laughs> go uh, ahead <laughs> I would just like to say that we have a lot of responses that we got, and these came in yesterday afternoon, I think around 5 p.m. Yep. Um, so uh, in all, trans all yeah, in transparency here, I have not had the chance to process through 150 pages of comments that we have in this, this uh, spreadsheet here. So I, I want to hear what the students have to say because this is going to directly impact them. And so I think we talked about this a little bit last time on the fact that maybe we should move this one more meeting out just to give adequate time to go through everything and make sure we're getting this right. 
Mr. Gibbs, that will still keep us on the same timeline in order to. We'll push it. We'll have to re-advertise and push it, but we can move it to the work, have this work session and on May 9th, it'll go public hearing May 30th for final approval, June, I think 11th. And that would still be well before school starts. So. Yeah, and Dr. Webley confirmed that that would still be time to incorporate those changes into the code of conduct, which is right now out for revisions. So this month they're working on those, or through May, they're working on those revisions. Okay. Those revisions are due, I believe, May 1st, right, Chris? Somewhere around there? <laughs> okay. So we had a conversation, sorry. You're good. I, you I, had a we just had a conversation about printing, and I actually I think right. maybe I was a little out of date, that we don't yep. actually print. <laughs> the dress code in the planners. We, it's all <laughs> virtual, digital. Yep. Dr. Webley said they print on request. So yep. if there's somebody okay. that wants them and they might print like a, so many to put in the front office so, so you can right. grab them. But well, and the truth is I thought about it. The dress code is different at many schools. So um, uh, because they can have tighter if it uniforms, whatever. No, I'm in agreement. I think we need to spend the, our due diligence looking over yeah. these, yeah. Uh, this data and uh, look at some more red lines. And I know I've had some more community feedback too and talked to m some principals too. And so I, I'm in favor of moving it off one more. I think um, if I can be correct on this, you would, even though the component of this, we do need to have some sort of a policy ready for the next board meeting so that we, um, what I think the proper process would be for us to review these and then set an individual meeting with either Ms. Han or Ms. Cody and say, these are the things that we're seeing and then you bring back to that meeting the next, is that about the correct process you're thinking? You could do it that way. I, I know in the packet that I sent yesterday, student services and Dr. Webley provided me a red line up that they tried to incorporate a lot of the changes into it. So you can look at that as well and say you agree or you don't agree with it when you meet with staff and that would be fun. If everybody's okay with that kind of a direction, you know what I mean? I think that that's pretty good because I'm, I'm reading and I want the public to understand that there's this conception out there that the students are advocating for like less dress code. And it's, and if you read some of these, there are some of those, but there's completely the opposite where many of our students are actually saying, stop this from going on. And I, I was, I was the, I mean, you look at number one, I mean, it, it's pretty, it's pretty good. So um, I think that there's a good uh, response from our students. And if that's okay with the direction, I think that that would be the best thing. Just understand board members that when this thing gets published in, you know what I mean, in seven days or whenever for the next one before March or May 9th, that if there's any changes that need to be made, we need to get it ahead of the, the actual meeting so that it's, it's in there. And I think that there's gonna be some more um, meetings added. So it might have a shorter window when you go to notice because of the extra meetings that are being noticed anyway. So it's not a, it's not gonna hurt us by waiting an entire meeting anyway. When, when I advertise it this week, it's gonna be on that schedule. So yeah, I have fun. to advertise it for those dates. Yep, and we'll have those days probably. So you're gonna advertise day. it for a workshop on May 9th or you're gonna advertise? Yeah, it, okay. this, this is the, the board's opportunity to make changes. So this meeting will now move to May 9th and then okay. the first public hearing will be May 30th. So that's where if you make changes at that, we're re-advertising and kicking it off again. So. Okay. So wait, so we normally have like a workshop like this. That'll be May 9th. Right. right. And you can make changes. If we don't Af make changes. If you don't make changes night. there on May 30th, you cannot make changes. Otherwise, we start over again. Right. Our next workshop, we need to be prepared to for right. the changes that we want to see in the yeah. policy. And then if it goes through that policy, when's the final date that it gets approved? The first one in June yeah. would be the public hearing number two. Which will give us enough time. Be, yeah. Because the other thing is we're not just printing something that we're handing to people. We also have to educate staff. We have to mm -hmm. create all the other pieces. That, that takes a little bit of time. Yeah. So I think the direction's great. I like some of these, uh, these responses. And so if you guys are okay, does anybody else have any comments on this one? We got some funny responses. We have somebody uh, who's advocating for clown shoes. <laughs> listen, uh, listen, I, I think these <laughs> are these are kind of like, funny. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Everybody pretty good on this one. Yeah. Um, with nothing else, we next topic is conscious discipline discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Wright had asked for board discussion on this item, and we have just provided some information as to where we are with the program. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Give me just one second. Sorry, I'm trying to pull it up. All right, uh, the main reason I wanted to bring this up was uh, at the last board meeting, you know, I, I brought up the question about conscious discipline and the cost that we were going to incur to put 225 of our educators through conscious discipline training. 
um, and felt that we could possibly look at taking that, those funds and using that for a different type of training. So I'm glad that staff has put together something that now looks like we currently have purchased conscious discipline. It's something that's not incurring any additional cost for the schools that are currently participating in it. Is that correct? I believe we had uh, four or five sessions the, towards the, like the last couple of weeks that were scheduled, but that's the only thing that we have that we have that we'll need to pay for. Okay. Um, in regards to the funds that were allocated, those uh, I thought it was two hundred twenty-five thousand, but this is now. I do have a question in regards to this last uh, or page four of this presentation. So it's saying that the funds that were allocated are now have been reallocated to different. How does that happen? Just out of curiosity, because I thought that would come before us. So in our federal programs, the board annually looks at our federal program sort of scope of work. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's done in June, July, August kind of time frame. And then if there's an amendment, those amendments are approved by the superintendent. So the board looks at the, the overall program under the information agenda. So there, there's not actual board approval of the Title one, two, three, four, um, Title IX programs. So you, but you do see it for any comments and, and perspective. And then as they are amended through the course of the year, those are amended through the superintendent's office. Okay, um, I guess my question still still remains a little bit on, because we were, it was presented before us to approve the 225000 for the conscious discipline. Okay. And so I, again, you know, I got several emails. What do you plan on doing with this? What do you plan on doing with this? Mm. And uh, so again, looking at okay. different training programs that are out there. So we still need to look at different training programs that are out there. There are other sources of funding, including this one, that can be available for those other sources of funding. This particular funding was a rollover, uh, rollover from the previous year, so we needed to get it expended by August. So that's why we, we put it in as an amendment to get that done. Okay. But if there are other programs that we want to fund, these federal programs are available to do so. So it, those two are not mutually exclusive. Okay, all right. Uh, well, it's something that I would like for us to, to consider moving forward. There's several things that our, our district needs to look at. Um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is this K through three reading that we need to focus in on. Um, and so I've been looking into the Orton Gillingham program as far as training some of our educators on this and the success that they've had. And so I just want us to be thinking about this as I gather more information and bring it back forward because I think this is something that could be impactful that we will see tremendous dividends on over the course of years if we could focus on getting our teachers up to date and trained on this. Hang on, let me just ask her. So what you're what I what I'm hearing you say in the charge to the board is there's uh, the money that was down there at the bottom on I think it was page four, you had mm -hmm. concerns about it going there because you wanted to try to possibly reallocate towards something else. Uh, well that that is true, but it sounds like for Miss Hand it's not either or. Uh, Correct. It's Correct. Okay. So if there are other other training programs the board would like us to explore, we yep. have the opportunity to do so as we're developing sure. our federal programs for the upcoming Sounds years. Sounds good. So Who you, decided, or you decided this, right? That somebody presented this to you or something? I, I guess I just wasn't clear on that process on how all that happened. So uh, Dr. Sullivan and I got together on this and she recommended that we could utilize the funds in an expeditious manner for something we needed to do. And so we repurposed them in this manner. Okay, and the only reason is, I mean, that, that money really was kind of earmarked for professional development of some sort, right? No. I mean, it's a training. Can I? Please. Title IV is actually not our professional development grant. Title II is. Mm -hmm. um, the conscious discipline applied to Title IV because of the second scope of work that is targeted on student well-being, discipline, counseling, and support. So it actually fit into the grant, not as a professional development item, but as a discipline item. The grant has three specific scopes of which we can apply for. So we generally will keep, we call it a graveyard, mm -hmm. of things that we either underfund or priorities that don't make it, and we try to always stick with previously identified board priorities to fill those gaps. Um, none of that's been approved, just prioritizing, but this grant is not the professional development grant. We have a Title II grant that is, and then we can always adjust and make professional development requirements. Reading actually wouldn't fit into the Title IV grant. It would not. Okay. It would not. Mm -mm. 
All right, thank you. For that. Um, but there is, there's, we can, we, we generally will adjust based on the timelines. And um, I feel really confident that if the board lands on a different priority, as Ms. Han said, um, we can work through the amendment process and readjust priorities. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. I think um, Ms. Campbell. Yep. Um, so thank you for clarifying that on the, the purposes of the Title IV grant. I appreciate that. And just um, to address, I think some were a concern I heard in there, Ms. Wright, you know, if, if any of these items are over 50,000, it, right. it will come back to us, right? That's why the other one came back to it, came to us because it was within the scope of the grant, but it was over fifty thousand dollars. So the superintendent can't approve that by himself, by herself. Um, the I, I would just uh, last night, uh, Mr. Susan, Ms. Jenkins, and myself attended the Bright Nehemiah action. In my action event, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. There. there was, yeah, and so one of the things that they were challenged. I don't know if you guys got a chance to meet with Bright, but um, they were talking about the science of reading, and I had I I called uh, Jane Klein yesterday and said, hey, where are we on the science of reading? And she shared with me about the work that we're already doing to train our in this uh, this great body of research that's come out. You know, getting rid of the or looking past you know the three queuing method and the whole, and, and to this very specific. So I before we. Uh, I would encourage you to talk to her about the training that we've we've launched into. Okay. Uh, specifically, it's tackling phonics, phonemic awareness. Those those five, I think, they're core things that are part of the that body of research, science of reading. So I just encourage you to have that conversation with her about what's already being done in in that uh, realm. Gotcha. Okay, uh, Mr. Trent. Well, I'm hope, uh, hoping we uh, continue looking at behavioral trainings uh, with maybe the Title IV funds, other programs. I I'm sure they're, as soon as the vote came down last time, they, they were thinking of what's next. I know I've gotten some calls on uh, other programs, so uh, I, I look forward to that conversation also. So. Ms. Jenkins? expertise, the professionalism to always present what they think is best for our students and our staff. Uh, clearly, I believe that this was best for our students and staff as well as they did. So I think asking them to come back with some other program <coughs> so quickly uh, is unrealistic. Uh, it would be disingenuous of them to come forward with something else that they don't necessarily have the buy-in themselves. We also, as you can see at the beginning of this presentation, are committed to, because there is no refund, 132 participants still going through conscious discipline training and implementing it within their classrooms. I said this last time, I think we didn't ask our staff and our schools that are using this program how they feel about it being ceased. Sure. So once it is, yeah. I think it would be in the best interest of this board to ask the staff in the schools how they feel when it is removed from their, from their school and how it's impacting them. All right, and with that, I would say that I have asked staff and I have moved through and being a former teacher for nine years, I know that part of getting a hold of discipline is, is that you have some sort of classroom management and there's a lot of programs that we have inside of our school district that are underfunded that go into that regard. I would say that for the past five, no, probably four years, I've advocated um, absolutely for a program that comes out of Escambia County with amazing metrics and amazing results. I think that we as a, as a school district have an opportunity. Uh, Ms. Han said that some of those are gonna be presented to us on May 9th, I appreciate it. And I think that there's pretty much board consensus to hold on um, actually spending any of that money on robotics and all that other stuff until we hear from the May 9th group that we may be able to expand some of that. Um, you may wanna have somebody talk about some of those other things that you were talking about. Does What's that make sense? Sorry, I'm not sure so May 9th, there's going to be some opportunities to come forward with presentations and stuff that are already existing programs inside of our district that might mm -hmm. help that. Is that about right, so Ms. Ham? We've convened a little focus group of, of folks that work on recruitment, retention, training, so talking about kind of all of these issues that blend together. Yeah. And so I think we can provide some briefings to you as we're working through the process, but we've got, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably the best way to say it. And all of these things um, relate to one another. So as we talk through the discipline audit, for example, yeah. 
there's pieces of that that relate to pieces of this. Yeah. Um, our training, we've had a, a lot of conversation with our teachers union about the types of training that they would like to have. So we've started to talk with our, um, our professional development folks and trying to engage them with our student services folks, our leading and learning folks. So we're, we're all talking together about the best way to deliver these services. I think that's a great conversation for all of us to learn and see what's out there and see where the things is. And it comes directly with what Ms. Jenkins had said, where we listen to staff and they present to us and we work from there. I think that's hold a good hold point. Hold on just a second, because I, I, when you were summarizing, it sounded like you were summarizing saying that we all had consensus to put a hold on the robotics. No, I said not team. all of us. I said there was a consensus. consensus. Well, I didn't know that we were, I, I don't think I weighed in on that. Well, so, it hasn't so, been brought before us, I, so right. I'm assuming that that's just like kind of what they're they're planning on doing. No, right. that is different. These right. is what if you're asking for. There's there's reallocating two hundred and forty thousand dollars to STEM robotics and all this stuff. What I thought I heard, and I may have been incorrect, is that instead of allocating to them, that we may be able to pause and use them towards so that we're not being restricted into any of those type programs that we hear coming forward. That was all. So, the two hundred and forty we need. We've already submitted the amendment to the state. We're waiting for the state to approve the amendment, and then we'd like to spend it on those items that are in the, the presentation. That's roll forward money that we need, to, we need to spend. We still have a lot of opportunity to bring forward different ideas on professional development through our federal programs that we can present to you. So, so those two things are not mutually exclusive, but I, I, would, I would recommend that we not okay pivot on the, the 240 at this point in time, because I think we need, we need to move forward, and these are things that we need to buy. And okay. have it, and the clock is ticking. And I think, Correct. I think that for some of the public to see what's going on, I think one of the keys is, is that the board is realigning some of mm -hmm. their priorities, mm -hmm. and I think that that's what's happening is, and we are in the process of learning some of these for the first time. So thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. allocating and understanding and everything else. Ms. And appreciate just it. in the interest of transparency, if, if folks are interested in what we're doing with our federal programs, the, there is information on our website, the full application as to how the, these monies are being spent, as well as the amendments requested, those are all on the website. So if you go to departments and programs and look under Title I, Title II, Title IV, uh, the information is there and available for the public to see. That's right. awesome. Thank I you. Just, I just wanted to add in here, I thank you, because I think this actually, you, you mentioned this alliance of board priorities that we have clearly said we want to be, to, I'm going to quote you, Mr. Susan, the district that sends students to space, not currently, like in their current form, but in the future, send them to space. Um, and so STEM, robotics, CTE labs, that, that very well aligns with what this board has yep. been consistent in saying, so good job. I have a request. Um, uh, I would like, Mr. Susan, if you could inform your fellow board members the schools that you visited and if you have any correspondences with those staff that feel a negative way towards it to share it with us because if we're going to be making decisions about this going forward, it would be helpful for us all to be privy to that same information. Are you speaking to conscious discipline now? Is that what you're saying, Ms. Jenkins? I'm yes, trying Mr. to Susan, figure you, out what you, you're saying. Yes, Mr. Susan. I am not going to Point of order. I'm not done. Point are. of order. Thank you. I asked you a question. Mr. Susan, I wasn't done talking. Thank you. Uh, when I make a statement for us to do our due diligence and ask our staff that we're impacting how they feel about a program being removed, and your rebuttal is that you already has, as if, as if that is end all be all, well then I think that the rest of the board deserves to hear the responses that you had. Because I too was an educator for six years. I too had personal experience with conscious discipline. Clearly my perspective is very different than yours and the perspective of our 4,500 teachers is going to be very different as well and diverse. And so if you are hearing differently, it would be beneficial for me to see those responses. So yes, I am requesting this communication that you claim that you had to be shared with the entire board. And if I get any communication, I will do the same. Ms. Um, Jenkins, I would remind you that as soon as you start putting people's names and information out there, that they you can uh, absolutely no, Ms. Ms. Reject Jenkins, it. I am finishing my answer Mr. to Susan, your question. Mr. Susan, do not raise your voice to me. You know me. what? Thank forget you. it. Forget it. You can let's redact their names, let's Mr. Move on. Susan. No, let's move on. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Your line. The next topic is MCOA recommendation athletics follow up. Yes, sir. Dr. Sullivan will be briefing you on this topic.
working on a segue and I'm just struggling. Um, but one thing I do know is that um, we all really care about the safety of our students. Um, a couple weeks ago, a month ago now, I'm not sure, it's a bit of a blur, you all had a board presentation yeah. on athletics, athletic issues, and athletic concerns. Little did I know on that day that I would be taking responsibility for <laughs> athletics. Um, so in the past couple weeks, um, I have worked alongside my directors, um, school principals, athletic directors, and officials to, to understand some of the immediate problems. And one of the immediate problems at hand is our contract with our Mid-Coast Officials Association. And it's an immediate issue, of course, because we've got to get it in place for the start of the year. But there were some challenges that really needed to be resolved, um, particularly in terms of timeliness of pay of the officials, if you all recall from that um, presentation. And the reason for that delay, it, they're just multiple, multiple points of failure, if you will. Um, in large part, the schools do not have the funds to initiate the original purchase orders. So typically in a situation in the fall, you would enter a purchase order for the season and pay against that purchase order. That encumbers all of your funds. And so this, many of our schools did not have enough funds to even open the purchase order to be able to pay against the invoices. The second thing, of course, is um, processing time with the Mid-Coast officials. They have to um, essentially by hand enter every roster for every school for every set of contests to generate the invoice process. Um, those invoices were handled very differently at the different schools um, with very different outcomes. The core of the issue comes down to finances. Um, right now, through athletic equity, the board for the last several years has been allocating around $200,000 a year to try to help offset some of the fees. As a former principal, I can tell you that you, you got a couple of buckets. If you have a home game, you have to pay officials. If you have an away game, you have to pay transportation, not to mention all of the other elements that come into it. And so what I saw in the contract is there was suggestions of decreasing officials um, and recommendations that would, in my opinion, be detrimental to the district and allowing them to have less than recommended officials just because of the cost. Um, and, I, and I think, in my opinion, looking at the history of it, that we need to consider increasing our funding commitment to the schools to maintain a safe environment. I know the board for several years has discussed um, what does those funds look like, what does equity look like, and my recommendation is that the district equitably fund all officials. And so uh, doing that serves two things. One, it definitely increases the board commitment. So the board commitment would increase from $200,000 a year to $550,000 a year. However, um, I think the district is very vulnerable in the fact that we have paid those official bills on the backs of uh, ticket sales. And for the vast majority of our sports, the ticket sales has not come close to covering the cost of the officials. Um, and safety really is weighing on me. So I've been wearing this athletics hat for just a couple weeks, um, but I wore it for a long time as a principal. And um, just how we support this as a district and how we've sort of left schools to fend for themselves um, it has been weighing on me. So my recommendation is the board consider that increase to that allocation. <clears throat> With that allocation at the district level, we would manage all of the accounting, logistics, and processing for the MCOA. And I'll just give you an example of what that might look like. And it's something we do right now with dual enrollment and some other funds. So um, the invoices would come to us. The newly hired county athletic director would cross-reference those. We would pay those invoices out. We do it with school nurses. We do it with dual enrollment. We do it with a ton of different areas. It's not problematic. Um, you know, we love spreadsheets, so we'll keep lots of detailed records on the different amounts. Um, right now, for the average of the last two years, officials have cost us around $528,000. I'm recommending $550,000 just because I'm unclear. <laughs> um, and for this first year, until we get a tighter rein, we've added sports, um, and I want to make sure that there's appropriate funding there. Um, the reason we are bringing this recommendation to you in advance of the other recommendations 
is the contract process with MCOA. And so we're looking for that informal three thumbs up to build out the contract under um, that expectation. In terms of funding possibilities, um, in discussion, of course, extensive discussions with Ms. Han, this is something that could be uh, Fund 100 or could be millage as well to be, de to be determined because athletic support was one of our identified areas in what we gave to the voters on that program development bucket, that bucket B that we're calling B1 um, to be specific. Um, and so we know that that's something that could look at, but in terms of developing out the system to begin the contracting in the fall, um, we're asking the board um, for any questions or follow-up or if they feel strongly against adding the funds towards athletics, I'd let, you know, we need to know that and go back to the drawing board or feeling confident that the board could take it. Um, from my lens as, as a principal of a school without a lot of money in the past, um, the equity of just knowing that your officials are covered is huge. I went out to all the principals and it's just unilateral support as you can imagine. Um, the time and effort and processing on the schools, they would very much appreciate the help in trying to manage that. Um, as well as just one less thing because in my opinion, having officials at every contest is not something that should be second guessed based on the difficulties they're having with finance. And so I just ask the board for their consideration, happy to answer any questions within my couple weeks on this hat, but again, lots of years on the school-based hat of trying to do it and um, to move forward in working out the contract with the officials. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Does anybody wish to comment on this? Mr. Trent? We're good. Um, so this would cover middle schools as well? Yes, ma'am. Yep. And then, so, so really, I mean, you're talking about a, not a seismic shift, but, you know, a big shift because not only would we be taking care of that, that all those ticket sales then would be able, the schools would be able to use those to pour back into the programs to buy equipment. Exactly. And you know, pay for training and all the other things that they have to cover. Exactly, so, so right now, um, in, in high school, for example, an average high school, has been receiving about $12,000 <coughs> in that $200,000 bucket. The officials' bills are typically between 34, 35 and 40,000. Okay. So out of the money that's coming into the program, the vast majority of it is going out to officials. And so um, things like transportation, you know, balls, <laughs> things that you need, safety equipment, there are a lot of things that have to get cut because you have to pay for officials. And so um, our families that are raising money, all of those things that are, you know, I think about the communities and yeah, you, it understand that you have to raise money for like the nicer uniform or the fancy bat, um, mm -hmm. but you would hope not to, for the bare bones execution of the activity. And so by taking that burden and as a district being clear, like, you know, we can't necessarily support athletics and activities mm -hmm. at how we would all hope and dream, but from a safety point of view, we're gonna cover officials in every site. I just think it's really important. Yeah, thank you for answering that question, and I, I appreciate it, and I'm in support. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I too am in support. So I, I met with the former athletic director, and I don't know if his stats were true, but what he said to me was that 9,000 of our high school students, approximately 13.5% of them, um, participate in a sport. So he, he said that this is a tremendous amount of our population, and then, not to mention, we have a lot of state champs and a lot of different sporting arenas. So um, I 100% support that. I, I'm glad that this is something that we can take off of the schools and I think it'll help support the children in the athletics department. So thank you for bringing this forward. This will be a good thing. Thank you. Absolutely, this should be something thank that's you. done at the district level. Um, I won't burden you with all the ideas in education you know, or in, 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 uh, in athletics. Um, I'm, I'm hoping the, the new person in that position, we have, we have lots to talk about, about mm -hmm. what the individual schools can do with the gate money. Yep. Um, to even the cost of students entering events. We'd really like to see that nearly nothing. Uh, we, we need more kids, more students taking advantage of, of activities. And, uh, but on this part, thank you so, yeah, for doing this. Thank you. Ms. Jenkins. 
you obviously have my support and thank you again for putting another hat on top of your rack appreciate you thank you thank you i think um i'm not sure but there was another official group that was coming in that was like basketball um they had started conversations about six eight months ago i'll have them contact you just to make sure that because i know the mcoa is one but there was another group that because of the because of what we were doing had decimated the amount of umpires referees and stuff in certain sports to where the mcoa could not you know what i mean give some they were having troubles mm -hmm. so this other group came in so I, I just remembered that so i'll get them in contact to make sure that in the event that they're in there okay. i think the guy's name scooter he's from titusville he runs he, he yeah huh. okay thanks yeah. i'll be in touch, in touch <laughs> I'll, with that but I, 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 i'll I, add I it to the list <laughs> yeah. but Thank no you. he's a really good guy um anyway so um this is this is also just so everybody knows this is a big deal because if we centralize this and pay it out of the school district we have referees that are getting paid mm -hmm. on a regular basis yeah. and more routine rather than the other piece which was killing us for retention and recruitment because we were losing refs because they were sometimes waiting months to get paid for like refing a game which was unfair yeah. dr sullivan this is huge thank you so much i really appreciate it oh. and the emphasis on safety is 100 yeah. percent right we, we appreciate it and uh, we'll certainly work towards um, the contract now that we know we have the board um, permission working very well with uh, mr muzzy and um, we will proceed thank yep. you Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. The next up is a topic of a draft charter independence citizens uh, committee for millage oversight. Um, is that you, Miss Sue? Yes, sir. I'm going to I'm going to introduce this. Uh, Miss Lasinski and Mr. Gibbs and I worked on this together. Uh, we modeled this after the independent citizens oversight committee for the sales surtax. It's recognizing that the millage is a little bit different because it's more on the operation side and there's quite a bit that goes on the compensation side versus the capital side. But just to kind of run through some of the highlights. Uh, the purpose of the Independent Citizens Oversight Committee, very similar, is simply to um, oversee, not direct, but to um, review yeah. how the, the millage is spent. Uh, the term, we talked about it and felt like, in this case, because the millage is a four-year program, that we would, we would, the term of office, we would recommend be the full four years. And then if, if it needed to be extended, the board could do that at that time. But it seemed like a better idea to just have it coincident with the entire term of the millage. One of the challenges I have with the surtax citizens oversight committee is the terms are staggered in two years and it just, it gets very yeah. confusing. So this would keep the group together for the full four years. Um, like the surtax, we recommended uh, annual reports to both the board and the audit committee as we do with the surtax with intermittent reports. Uh, recommended a minimum quarterly, not, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say that, not quarterly, but a minimum four times a year with the way the millage revenue comes in quarterly may not make exact sense. So we might be, might make more sense to have a January meeting and a February meeting and then an August meet something like that versus a strict quarterly. So we just said minimum of four times per year. Uh, with the surtax, it says uh, quarterly, and we actually meet six times per year because that, I think, benefits us to have the group be together every other month. Um, may not be the same with the surtax or with the millage because of the big um, revenue that comes in in December versus the surtaxes every month. So the, the revenue stream is a little bit different. We did recommend a similar membership structure, uh, no less than seven, no more than 11 members. That's worked really well with the, the um, surtax citizens oversight committee. The qualifications for the members would be folks uh, that are in fields relating to the purpose of the millage. On the, the surtax side, it was a little more capital oriented. So we had construction finance type folks, but on the, on the millage side, I think it's a little bit broader. So we, we left it um, much, more, much more broad. Uh, the terms would be, again, starting uh, July 1st through June 30th, uh, 2027. And I believe that, that sums up the, the points in the charter. I'd like to get this on an upcoming board agenda because I, I'd like to get it approved. And then the next item, I'll talk a little bit about how we solicit members, but I, I'd like to get going so that we do have um, this body seated in July. Everybody okay with just giving her the thumbs up to move on it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're good. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. And then the follow-on item is the member selection process. Um, 
Some of you may have been here when we did the, uh, the surtax. I know, Mr. Susan, you were part of that selection yeah, process as a, as a member. Uh, but this was kind of done independently in terms of the initial proffering of candidates for the independent oversight committee to the board. I've talked with Ms. Kershaw and met with the board at Brevard Schools Foundation. They are willing to, to take on the vetting process, so the applications would be sent to them. They would review the applications and present a recommended slate of, of members to the school board. There's lots of other ways to do this, but I thought I would, I would propose one way that we could do that that is somewhat independent from the school board to create that initial independent group. Okay. They'll, they'll bring back the recommendations of who, uh, once they vet the candidates, yes. and then we at that point will select. Yes, the school board makes the actual selection. The Brevard Schools Foundation or another independent group would vet the applications, review them, and make a recommendation to okay. you. Thank you. So I just had a, a question, um, because I was looking, when I was reading the last agenda, I was like, well, how, does that, how did that first group get picked? Because now what we do is, with ICOC, if someone rotates off, or they resign or whatever, then the ICOC Correct. takes applications and they pick their Correct. own members. And that's how it would be set for Correct. in the future. Mm -hmm. So, but I, in the, it, with this other, with the ICOC, the group was selected by the, the, the chambers and kind of a North South, so are, are we talking about just foregoing that? That became a process in and of itself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wasn't here when okay. that happened either, so I, I don't fully know, but I, my oh, understanding of that process is it was a process to select the process and gotcha. got a, a little bit unwieldy. Oh, right? So I, I felt like this was a, a good option that already includes community members okay. uh, that could take a look at the, at the potential applications, but there are certainly other options if the board would like us to do something different. Okay, and then just just again going back to the, the charter then, if there were to be any vacancies because someone resigned or moved mm -hmm. away or we need to we renew it yeah. and somebody decided not to re up, um, then that would be just like the AOC, the, the actual Yes, ma'am, it would, would go through the I go through the citizens oversight committee to review applications and then make a recommendation to the board for the appointment. Okay, so you're right. So so the so the Brevard Schools Foundation would just be the kind of like FSBA in our superintendent search. They're they're the ones Correct. Taking the applications and organizing them for us. Correct. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I think you're good to go. Good to go. Yep. All right, thank you very much. All right. Um, next up is the review the 2000 policies. Um, if you guys want to take One a hour. second. <laughs> we only got. I think an hour and a half. Oh, we got they, a 430? They cut me down there. No, um, if we, you guys want to take a break for a couple minutes? Yeah. All right, let's take a five minute break and get back here quick.
Welcome back, everybody. Wanted to uh, take a look at our um, 2000s. You can bring up uh, Paul's email that has the Neola templates. And if you guys take a look at these, there's, as I was going through them, there's probably about four or five that really have revisions. And then the rest of them are just updates to make sure that they're with statute. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's, and some of them have been updated. I think we're going to slowly start to get into that where. There's 23 that have been updated. Yep. Oh. Yep. So I think if we just kind of move through the Neola template and then do this, we should move pretty quickly. Um, the way I'll do it is I'll just bring it up. I'll say, does anybody wish to go with the Neola, whatever, and then we'll move to the next one just like we were doing. So the first one up is uh, policy 2105, and it's our mission statement. Um, the one that has from Neola, I think, is too cumbersome and goes a little into all kinds of stuff, and I think the one we have is good for now. Are you yeah, okay? I'm fine with this. Good. Person. All right. Uh, good with that, Paul. Yep. Move on. Okay. Next one is 2110, 2110, Statement of Philosophy. Again, um, it references the standard policy on top of it. I think, um, what's that? So um, I figured this out after our last meeting. If you go down to the bottom of the yellow version, it says last not modified by Tammy Schroyer. That was when she pulled them all, but it, the copyright date is going to be the teller. Um, the copyright date is the same as yeah. ours, so they don't have any updates. Yep. So um, as far as I'm concerned, this one looks good, 2110. If you guys are okay with that, we can move on to the next one. Good. We good? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Ms. Jenkins, you good? Okay. Next one's 2111. Um, you have, this is parent and family involvement in the school program. It references two of the policies that are, that are pretty in there. And then if you look at, sorry, pretty in there is kind of Leola ridiculous. Leola has the implementation portion, which yep. we do not. So they're on this one, I noticed when we started, in Neola's version, we started getting to the bottom half, the newer section that we, ours doesn't include. It looks like it's coming straight out of the Parents' Bill of Rights, and we mm -hmm. did um, implement a policy yep. that we had all that language in there. I can't remember the number, and I didn't get a chance to go find it, but I might, are you with, you remember Paul me? I remember did doing something, I don't remember off the top <laughs> of my head. Come on, Paul. <laughs> I don't so, <laughs> remember what number it is off the top of my head. There's a couple of little things. So my suggestion, there's a couple of little things in here besides that part. I don't know if we need to add all of that if we already have it somewhere you mean else. the implementation portion of this? Yeah. So we, right. So the, the part, mm, yes, the implementation part is pretty much if you look if you look at that, if you're familiar with the language from the Parents' Bill of Rights, it, oh, it's practically verbatim. So, but I think we already have that somewhere else, and that, that's what I can't remember. So, I, but I would like us to, I think we should take a look at some of it just because there were a few things. Uh, Let me just check them all. Up towards the top. All right. I will, no, I will have, if you will notice the bold note at the very bottom of the Neola version, it says that we should select all the options that have up towards the top in order to comply with. Yep. Um, state and federal law and, yep. and Title I. I'm okay with that. Yeah, but there are a few things, small things, but um, I don't, they have that extra paragraph about uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I, I think that was just defined to parents. I think we kind of got that with the family's definition, but there's some, a couple other little so, things I think it might be good just to take a look at this one. So omit paragraph two, is that what you're suggesting? Oh, I don't know. I mean, omit. We She's can, just trying to say so, take a Do we have to it. add it in? I don't know if we have to add it in. We can if we're going to look at it. That, okay. But the other the other little things are, are, are down into the like relationships with um, of the effective communication. There was a couple of things in there, I think. Yep. I liked a lot of the checkoff versions and we can add the implementation and I think we're good. So we can have. There's no red flags. Staff, on staff bring this one back. To match new old, to match new old. I mean, I, this one, our policy says families. This one references parents, so it's probably. Up, more up to date. Yeah, there says parents and families. I, I said, I, I don't I know. I like the Neola version. I just like yeah. that with those, with all those breaks. I don't know what you guys are talking about, but just have those just like it's recommended. 
That's what we have. That, that's yep. the, that is a part that is almost identical uh, to what yep. we have. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then you have the implementation. Is there Which any I think we have in another policy. That's what I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, I think you can have it in two. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. I think we're okay. Is everybody yeah. okay with that? All right. We're good. So direction is to just adopt the Neola one. Next one up is 2120, school improvement. Again, taking a look at that, looking at the Neola template. I wrote on here, again, I looked at this like almost two months ago at this point, so I'm like, I, I'm having to jog my memory of <laughs> yeah. like, oh, okay. Um, I wrote on here, missing early warning system section. I don't know, let me pull up in the Neola. And see. Does it have something about that? Because my note may not make any sense to me. Oh yeah, there's a whole section. <laughs> so there's there it is. Yep. there's a there's a, the part about waivers. Mm -hmm. We're in twenty one twenty, right? Yeah. Yes. In Neola, there's a specific list of um, yeah things that can Carl you know, Perkins can be waived, general right? education. Yep. Right, 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 and so. Um, it just gives the list rather than just saying, it's saying the same thing, but the Neola version is a little more specific. Yep. And it talks about the superintendent is authorized to waive mm -hmm. those rather than ours, which says the board is authorized to waive. So what she's saying is, is that the uh, Neola is more specific. It includes it. We good to go? Yeah. I think we should update it to match Neola. I mean, yep. I think so too. I would say that we adopt the Neola version, which is more updated has more specific points on the waivers. Um, Do we want any other things in the early warning system? Because it's, all right. We need to look at this one for a second, sorry. This no, 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 I'm, I'm here. All right. Paul, are you familiar? Maybe this is, I don't know. I don't wanna, <laughs> Jane's waving her hand. That early warning system, is that something you can shed some light on for us? Yes. Is that okay, Ms. Hannah? She. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't want to, I'm not doing any volunteering today, but if you can shed some light, that would help. Because I'm sure we're already doing it, we just may not have it written down in policy. So it's statutorily required. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was on a Bureau of School Improvement meeting this morning and learned there's going to be more changes to the school improvement <laughs> process. Uh, where they're gonna take the federal index and add that component. So they're re the state currently is rewriting the template uh, because of a audit that was found for the state of Florida. And so they're trying to just, they did not even have the details. They're gonna have them in June and add that to uh, the school improvement template that will be coming forth for next year. So this might be something that we update, but let's wait, let's push this one out long enough for everybody to catch up? I think we'll, we'll be updating it again based on what I learned this morning is that they're going to be adding the, um, the subgroup data in a more monitoring piece of the school improvement process. We monitor our subgroup data, but it's not part of the state template and we follow the state okay. template. So, so should okay, we table split. this one until mm -hmm. it comes back in June? Because otherwise we're going to have to go right I back think, in. Right. I think the idea would be we want to adopt the Neola piece, right? But in the event that there's other ones that come on, if you'll bring something forward when that happens, that's perfect. So Neola will yeah. uh, <laughs> adjust the We're going to get a bunch of them. Yep. If yes. the state changes in June, Neola will probably issue their update Okay. August, September-ish. That's perfect. As long as, yeah. we, as long as we're within compliance, we're good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, next up, 2125. I got notes written on this one. School okay. advisory councils for school improvement and accountability. All right. Um, one of the things that is listed on the first section here for the school advisory council, um, there's not, it says that we review, but it doesn't really, s we review membership, but how often are we reviewing membership? I don't know if we should put something in there to that effect. Oh, there's, and there's, yep. yep. Does it, where are you? In I'm that? in the second paragraph. The board shall review the membership composition of each advisory council, but it doesn't say when or how. I mean, so it's, so we, we have, shall review when. So a couple of years ago, I asked 
if we could get all of the SIP plans, they're the school improvement plans that okay. are passed, right? That are that come out of each one of the schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked. So what they do is is they create a database, and we log in, and we can click on each school improvement plan. And basically, that's the roadmap that that school feels is appropriate for student that achievement is. and everything else. It's, it it exists right now. You can go look at the school improvement plans for all of them. Miss Klein's coming, or go She's ahead. Back. Okay. The school improvement timeline, once we attend the June training from the state, we'll establish a timeline on when everything is due. We send you that timeline, and then the uh, school improvement plans come to you for approval, for final approval. You have uh, approximately two, three weeks to go through and make any suggestions, bring them back to us, and then we take them back to the school. So every school, like currently, as Mr. Susan just said, Currently, you can look at any school improvement plan in our district. Okay. But the school bases their um, goal based on their student data. And is that, that that is looked at annually? Is that how often is that yeah, done? Every summer. It, yep. Okay. It shows up on a board um, board agenda item in September, Octoberish. October. Okay. And and that document will list the members of the SAC for every school. So that at that time we would be, that's when we approve or review as this policy says. Ours Good. is the same, ours is, Neela hasn't updated there since this one was, by the way. And I think, I think um, if you look at this, uh, this one talks about, yeah. the advisory council, the SACs, what, what that is is there's, there's some statutory uh, opportunities for us to create more of a collaboration between the board and some of our advisory committees. Um, if you read the statutes, it talks about how that's kind of under our jurisdiction to work with them because they're kind of our, our wing into the schools. Mm -hmm. So I was, once we get that update and we get to that process, I may ask all of us to create like a mini advisory team from the schools that comes and just advises, you know, talks to us is, um, and gives us updates as to what's going on inside their schools. So um, with that, I think we're good on this, right? Is everybody okay? Does anybody have any up? Anything else that they would like to add to it? I mean, are we going to implement the NEOLA template? Because again, we don't have a, yep. a conflict dispute resolution process that's uh, tied to this policy here. I'm sure we have one maybe somewhere else, but. Hang on just a second, yeah. because one of the things. Ours has additional stuff that's not in NEOLA. So it's going to be, do you want NEOLA's template or do you want to add what we don't have from NEOLA's template into what we've created? Right. Um, yeah, I feel like the resolution piece is missing from ours. So ours um, speaks about the school recognition funds. I don't see that on NEOLA's. It speaks about the annual budget. I don't see that on NEOLA's. we had a policy about SAC and I'm not finding it so um, we did it was referenced I mean, there's some statutory yeah, yeah about school improvement plans I thought we had a, um, I thought we had a policy on school improvement plans so well this one in here under duties it says school improvement yep. plan process so we may need to add some things is that I think what you said was correct in that anything that's inside the NEOLA template that we don't already have Paul would be something that we could add and then if that that's, would if that's the direction we can just take what we what Neola yep. has in their template and we don't have in ours and yep. add it into ours you guys okay with that yeah I mean I can't see a reason why we would take either one of these out it's only a couple things yeah that we have additionally that Neola doesn't does anybody see any reason that we should nope. not have those good all right if you follow that one there Paul next one's 2131 um, Educational goals. Uh, this is, uh, if you pull up the NEOLA template, it might be a little bit different. Actually, NEOLA has a 2128. That's that right. We do not You're have. right. District Advisory Council. Because we don't have a district advisory council. This is what this what it speaks to inside the statutes. Is so, this something the district's ever had? No. So it's pretty cool if you look at it, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I could see the benefit of yep. implementing one of these. Mm -hmm. What does the board feel like? I like it. And if you read some of the statutes regards to the SAC committees and stuff like that, it calls for some of this kind of involvement. Um, you guys want to discuss it? Do you guys want to table it because it's a big, big, big one and we come back to no, it? I, I mean, I think we can talk about it. I think okay. we talk about it now while we're here. All right, let's do it. I think it's, um, I'm not necessarily saying 100% table it or that I'm against it or for it, but uh, I think implementing something like that would be an important conversation after a superintendent is hired as well. I don't know. It's pretty simple. I mean, parents, students, community members. I mean, I don't know if a superintendent would have anything to do with telling us, no, we don't want students. So. Yeah, the only thing is if we were going to give him part of it. So if we were going to ask the superintendent to appoint anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. again, I don't think that that's. Um, I, Controversial. I, I think we can have a group like this with or without a policy, right? I mean, so it's kind of a decision of do it. But, you know, one of the challenges that we have when we have district-wide committees like this is the, you know, the, the distance people have to travel the involvement. So I, I wonder if rather than one centralized um, group that's, we can make it however big we want. Because it you know it leaves blanks this many yeah you know, it leaves blank this many parents this many students. Um, You're talking about going to a regional type thing, or like yeah, each district uh, has their own kind of. Is that I what don't you're know. Thinking? I mean, because then because no, because then we kind of start getting segmented. I don't know. I I, it's okay. I wouldn't really write it for this conversation today, just to be honest. So I'm not. I, you know, like Ms. Jenkins, I'm not opposed to. It. I just um, you talked earlier about how we have a lot to do. <laughs> well, I, I think that this is basically our backbone. If we have, I, I, I actually love the idea of bringing parents, students, community members, and teachers and them to talk to us on a regular basis. I mean, I, I have um, my former students that are now having kids, so it's kind of interesting. So I, I, I just, I think that this is something that I'd like to do. I mean, if you guys want to sit here for a second and, and pound through it, I'd love to put something like this together, but if you're having some concerns and um, either way, I'm okay with. What would be the, what I'm trying to look down to see the purpose because I'm what I'm seeing is we're going, he, here's who's going to be on the committee, mm -hmm. here's how they're going to be selected. Yep. Um, you know, in different ways. It can come from SACs or it can be, come from whatever. But there's really no definition. Oh, it says the, the purpose of yep. the DAC will be to advise with either regard the superintendent to the or development. the board. Yep with strategic plan especially in regard um, to goals it looks pretty good right um as to serve as a major communication link between the district the schools and the community mm -hmm. um and so basically to kind of help be that we had we had that we have that in place with all the community ambassador groups which were on a much much larger scale actually because yeah. we had we had faith-based, a faith-based community ambassador group. We had the chambers and a community ambassador group. We had employee of the year, all the previous employees of the year and the previous teachers of the year, those were ambassador groups. And sometimes it would be broken down like um, the superintendent would meet with, you know, regionally, everybody from those groups here, or it would sometimes be, I'm just gonna pull in all the faith-based today, or whatever, and, and throw out the idea. It, and they were very involved in the making, the recreation of the strategic plan and with its update. And so that was kind of on a much larger, uh, scale um, and something honestly in whether formal or informal needs to continue to happen um, mm. so this is kind of getting it more specific and saying this is the way we want to get the community input is through this and I think um, that other one didn't report to us or collaborate with us it was more about collaborating with dr. Mullins and staff and stuff like that so well, I, I, I mean, like this we I can mean, have it do whatever we wanted to but I'm saying yeah. we had community groups large groups of you know into I you know I think Tammy can probably come it's about 300 total in the 225 and those community um, sorry <laughs> ministerially speaking um, who were involved in, in getting their input and in whether meetings or uh, you know, digitally or whatever, virtual meetings, all different kinds of ways. So, you know, there's there's lots of ways to do it. I don't know that we um, have to limit it to this. Was there ever a formal document that they said these are the strategic 
initiatives that we would like. You know, I think it was just inputted to staff, and then staff took what they said and moved through it, something like that, right? Um, that no, actually, process. I think he usually met with them himself and would put out, here's some, you know, first it right. was a listening tour, you know, what are the what are the priorities, what do you think you're going to be working on, taking all the input. I remember he sat down with each of us as board members and went through actually over multiple one-on-ones because the list was so long. What do you think about this? Where is this on your priority? This is, this is what I'm hearing from the community. Mm -hmm. You know, formulated that, yes, with staff, with a strategic plan. But, you know, one of the things that in the past, the superintendent, going back to Dr. Blackburn, and maybe previous, I don't, I'm not familiar, develop the strategic plan. If we're going to move into where the board has more ownership of the strategic plan, we can do that. Um, but that community input is still really important. And then when there were going to be changes or updates, it would, you know, he would go back out to the same people and say, here's where we are, let me give you a report card of where we are and what, what am I hearing from you? It was just more informal. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely going out with those strategic plan points. All right, I, I like this opportunity because it keeps it to a smaller tight-knit group to give us um, direction and if the new superintendent would like to come in and create what that was before, I think that would be a good idea too. Um, I don't necessarily disagree though with Ms. Jenkins on this maybe saying that we talk to our new superintendent and, and okay. have them involved in this process because it may be a collaboration of what we had and then this right. policy together to kind of come up with what the new superintendent right. wants. Or they might have an even better idea. They might even have a better idea. They might. We good? All right. Then we'll pause it. Let's go on to the next one, which is, let me get these new ones up. Oh, wait, Keep forgetting to go goals. back to the new okay. one. All righty. 2-1, educational one. outcome. One's ours. <clears throat> This is one of the ones that is, unless we see something, this is one of the ones that has been um, reviewed within the last five years, and we would need to come back to it next year on our continual rotation, but this one was updated in 2018. So we're within the five years. Yeah, well, we can just update it now and not <laughs> worry about made it. it. <laughs> All right. So if you guys take a look at V1 and V2, a little bit of differences here. One is, like Ms. Jenkins said, almost exactly like what we have. Um, and if there's anything anybody wanted to add, they could. I have a couple things that I might want to suggest. V1 goes, I think, a little more in depth. Yeah, it looks like it. But it's up to you guys. What I, my, my concern was is that I wanted to be able to put, I didn't see anything in here, capacities for fulfilling, satisfying, outstanding, understanding the ability to cope with change, like all of those things. Um, how about like understanding the workforce and ensuring the success, like understanding what the workforce needs are and what mm -hmm. their opportunities are. I, I see the first one, job skills for the workplace and skills and attitudes to obtain further education. Um, I don't know. Sorry, give me a minute. I'm going through them. Mm -hmm. telling you if we implement version one that scares me <laughs> a bit just because I'm I mean honestly if you look at some of these questions they're all really great life skills that our students all should come out of our mm -hmm. schools with um, I can speak to the fact that I Citizenship. work with youth every single week and there's a lot of these skills that our students do not have well, push it yeah these are goals these are goals I, I'm looking at the statutes that they come from actually some of these are kind of spelled out yep I really like version one. It's very detailed, but I, I like version one. I like it too. I just think what would it look like if every one of our students came out of our schools with these skills? Or it, it, at least we set that expectation, right? So. Leisure time. I know. I'm like, some of these are really good skills, and I'm like, wow, this would be. Um, anybody else wish to? There's a kind of a thing on the floor saying, let's go with version one. Are we yeah. okay with that? Yeah, yeah. Does anybody any, object um, version? Yeah. Version do you guys? One? Anybody want to tie yeah. into it? Miss Campbell, you okay with it? I 
to be quite honest, I didn't look at the version one. You want to take a second? And I, um, I don't make decisions like that, Mr. <laughs> Susan. I'm happy for staff to bring it back to us and let's take a look at them, you know, and um, I mean, I don't see anything just looking, breezing through it that I think is like, oh no, I don't want our kids to learn that, you know, I mean. I'm okay. So you'd like to uh, say, go ahead and move forward with V1, and then if there's any com uh, conversations that you may have or con concerns, you can address them as it goes through the process, right? Sure. Okay. Are you okay with that, Ms. Jenkins? Yep. <clears throat> okay. All right. Two, one, three, two. <clears throat> yeah. So these are education process goals. Um, again, the NEOLA template <laughs> has been modified in 2003, but it goes back to the original one. Looks like we have almost all of them. The one thing that I was going to mention is, is that there's uh, not a real strict on uh, educational process goals. It says instruction, you know, needs and interest of students and all that stuff. And, but there's nothing talking about the relationship of uh, parents and students and stuff like that and I didn't know if anybody wanted to add something uh, constructive cooperation with parents and community groups I guess that's okay but it just doesn't mean that doesn't tell me like the parent like listen to the needs and parents and accept input on their child for the success of the student but these are kind of overall process goals I didn't mention parents and F it does but it's not what was your suggestion as far as changing that? Just, just a more specific thing about parents, but you know, like you're talking about educational process goals and we're talking about collaborating with parents and then we have in there constructive cooperation with parents and community groups. Just feels like it's kind of part of something else, but it, it, it can be there. And we have a whole parents bill of rights that we can make, right, it, you know so. what I mean? So, so if you guys are okay, I'm okay. We can just I'm roll okay this with thing. this one. I didn't mark this okay. one a lot. Yeah. We're good? 2132 is good. All right, Paul, just update it. We're good to go. And the next one is, is 2205, instructional planning, refers to three statutes. Um, our old one referred to three statutes. The new one only refers to one. Huh. <clears throat> it's kind of weird. They're not different, right? No, it's exactly the same, but the old one in our book refers to two other statutes. Yeah, but I wrote down on mine, so it looks like the statute, for statute 1001.11, speaking about the Commissioner of Education, so I had a question mark and I wrote that because I was like, I don't know why this statute is cited here. It's probably and why they cleaned it up. Statute 1008.385 speaks about educational planning and info systems. So I wrote down notes on those, which I'm thinking maybe I was looking at the statute thinking this doesn't really correlate to what we're yep. speaking about, which might be why they decided to take them out of there. So this version is exactly like um, exactly like the one we have. So if you guys are okay, we can move on. Yeah. Do, we, a, do we need to? So do we need to? Do we need to remove the statutes we, that are on there? Is that a technical change? I think I've asked that question before. I'll oh, look. <laughs> Paul. If it's not needed, Paul, you can get rid of them. Yeah, right? I mean, I mean, is there any it harm in, in citing in a statute that literally pertains nothing, nothing to, to this policy? <laughs> it's just misleading. So yeah, if, let's get if rid. If I of can it. get rid of it technically, I'll do it. If not, I'll leave it until we get an update. Neola updates it yeah. and says they don't need it, so we can. The just get third rid of it. statute is is relevant. It's just the one about the commissioner. Right. Yeah. The first. Right, yeah. Board directs the curriculum of this district. Right. One, two, two, one, zero. Are we good? So leave that one as is. Yeah, the, the one we were just on, yes. We are on 2210 curriculum development. It's pretty, if you look at this, it's pretty, the only difference we would do is, is a superintendent may make progress reports to the board periodically or annually. I think we've chosen periodically and then there's requirements in here from updated state statute, I believe, in order to report back to the Florida Department of Education. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, this one was updated in 2022, so I'm going to assume that some of that is... Um, for the most part, all of the language is pretty much the same, except for those updates. Yeah, so I, we need to update this so that we have the yep. updated requirements. So is there you, any reason that we picked periodically as opposed to annually? Because it's more frequent. More frequent? 
I mean, progress reports as far as curriculum development. I mean, if you guys want to put annually or periodically, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's less than annually. It's one of those words that's subject to interpretation, like ongoing, which you're like, well, annually could be ongoing, or every two years could be ongoing. It, you know, it's I mean, we've, we've been getting them twice a year, specifically, this not curriculum updates, but academic achievement updates and all those things at least twice a year. So, so then do we want to put that so that it's uh, that reflects what we would like to see? I'm our, yeah. I mean, if you want to, I mean, if, I don't want to go back to the right rises policy if we're only changing Over. that one phrase, Over. but if we want to <laughs> change it. Anyway at least annually, you know, or whatever, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not gonna. What do you guys want? I'm getting a roll over that. We gotta change the whole thing anyway, it's gotta come before us, so if you only add a couple of words, it's okay. What are we changing the, the rest of it? Because that's, that's the only thing I really, s I mean, it looks like the rest where of it was, all. Where was the reporting thing that you found? It's on the bottom of the, of the first page where, are you talking about that, where it says, where we select? we would like it annually or periodically mm -hmm. yeah. I'm okay with annually or periodically or at least in front of and then check annually I, it doesn't matter to me I, I think we're focusing on semantics too much I think the yeah. word periodically leaves it open the board's in charge of the superintendent if you don't like that they're not reporting something to you enough you, you, you can tell them to report it yep yeah I'm not seeing you were talking about a change earlier about reporting Oh, no, I see it. I see that the, the first one on the second page, annually a date determined by the FDOE. Yeah. District shall submit a board approved K-12 comprehensive reading plan to the department for the specific use. That's new statute. Yeah. Okay. Based upon a root cause analysis. We're That's good. That's the change. Yep. We're good to say we will take the NEOLA update and check annually. Is that what we want to do? Well, I think we need a consensus. So it doesn't, I mean, whatever everyone to wants. To me, periodically to means more often. <clears throat> Or gives yeah. room for more often. Yeah, I don't so want to I think annually. Yeah, I think periodically is better than annually. You okay with that? I'm fine with it. All right, moving on from 2210, we're going to take the Neola update on to 21, 22. Hang on, let me make sure there's nothing in between there. Yep, 2215. So this one we have updates on. Yep. Have you guys had a chance to look at the two options? There's only one option, is there? Mm. No, there, there's two different options within the one version. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't sorry. clarify. Yep. Um, this policy is actually going to be revised with new it, legislation that's passing. It so. Is. Yeah. Uh, do you want to pause on this until we get well, it? Because we're just going to have to redo it anyway. You're going to have to redo it. Yeah. Um, right. Tons of this is going to end up being changed yep. after this session. Paul, are you okay with that? Yep. Take this one, pause it, and bring it back. All right. Great point, guys. Moving through these. All right. So we're next is 2216. They don't. Have, oh, wait. Gifted education. Looks like we made our own. <laughs> and Neola has nothing. This is a first. Uh, and we did and I looked through it. extensive work And on I looked this. at it and I said, this is great. <laughs> this might be the longest policy we have. <laughs> and we created no, it on our own. No, it's not. The financial policy oh. that Cindy brought us a couple <laughs> years ago is the longest policy that we have. I haven't actually looked, but I remember, you remember, Cindy, when we did that? It was, it's very long. It's even longer than charter school policy. We'll get there. Yeah. So but are it's we in like okay? 8,000. So I looked through it. Are you okay with that? Yeah, no, I don't have this one marked up at all. So yeah. I'll just give you, I mean, one of the things that we did in that was to to screen one just we're screening all kids in second grade so you kind of remove that you know either the parent had to say I think my kids gifted or the teacher right. had to say I can't, we're, we're, we're doing that initial screening for everybody in the second grade and just trying to open that up make it a little more equitable but we did a lot of work on that I'm not saying I'm not willing to do a lot of work again but I think we have that we have a good one there yeah all right we're good all right moving on 22 20 Adoption of courses of study. They haven't. They haven't changed anything since two thousand two. Is there anything in here regarding financial literacy and the implementation of that? Let me look. Sorry. The board statute. I don't know that it gets specific to the, okay. the, the actual, actual courses of study. Course. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. 
just talks about what's required within them and for them to be presented. Right, right. If, okay. you're, if we're going to do Good. something new, it has to have all these things. Okay. We're okay? Yeah. Yep. It's, it's exactly the same, right? Yep. Okay. Paul, show it updated. 2230 on this one. Is there something on the old one? Nope. There we go. And course guides. All right. 2230 course guides. Oh, wait. Seems to be in line with the almost like identical to what it was. I know, but like, I know I'm trying to like. It adds uh, H. So usually it's spread out. Yeah. So um, when you look at the bottom section of yep. it, we don't have anything selected there for the. All right. So it says the superintendent shall be responsible for the preparation of course guides and may establish administrative procedures related to the preparation. But then it looks like we we should have selected one of those two options, right? Mm -hmm. Or both. I, I don't think it's a have to. They would have told us if we had to. Where are you? At the bottom. The bottom where there's a check mark. Where so you're responsible for the preparation of course guides of the, of the existing guides shall be submitted to the board for approval. I like that. We're still there. Before they I thought are, we left that. Before <laughs> they are implemented, yeah. Sorry. I thought we moved on. Yep. I think both so, of, I, I, I can't so. see a check, disadvantage check, check. to having bo all of those yep. in the policy. I agree. Do we have we done that before? Course guides submit to this to the board for approval. No. Huh? Yeah. Uh, they're all online. Yeah, that's why it's not checked. <laughs> I think it should be added to the policy for the board to review it. Jean. Yep. Okay. Jess. How about you guys? Any objections to adding it? Red flags? No? Uh, okay. Does that mean we need to go back and approve all of the course guides that we have? No, it says so new. Far. It says new. This is all new course guides. <laughs> <laughs> and revisions of existing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if they're all online, I guess we don't need to keep them in a file in the office. Yeah, of that's the really outdated. That's definitely 2002. So that's very outdated. <laughs> can, oh, come on. We can. It's I mean, I'm a paper girl. I like Listen. to have things that I can flip through and write on and make People notes. People can go online and print them out. Yeah. <laughs> but what if the internet fails? Oh, dun dun dun. All right. So check the first one in its uh, before sub box they before they're implemented. Get rid of the copies on all current course guides. We're good to go. Hold on. I I'm okay. just I don't know about the before they're implemented thing because that is going to pose a barrier very likely in terms of timing of meetings and things to that have to get rolling yeah. and the last minute changes that often our state makes as they walk to the they're podium. Coming. I think they're going to say all of that as well. <laughs> well, sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, all the curriculum guides are online. We review them every single summer and make adaptive changes based on changes of state statute, course code guides, things like that. Super transparent, more than happy to put them in front of the board. Um, timing in terms of before implemented, implemented might be a little difficult. They basically um, get redone every summer and then rolled out, redone minor changes, but it would fall under that language. Um, we'd certainly put them on a board agenda, it's not a problem, but it might be difficult to say before they're used because they're a resource for our teachers. So would there be anything that would stop you from just, put, I guess, putting them in front of the board during the summer meeting for us to review them and then if there were any issues with them, I don't suspect yeah. there would be, but. We, we also get uh, teacher input to what they want changed. For example, the ELA, the pacing curriculum guides, those are all going to be some revisions this summer again. Right. So the timing is the issue because we will finish them the last uh, middle of July for August. So, but absolutely we'll bring them to, to you. But under consent, I, we imagining yeah. just the process. I, I think putting the uh, before implementation piece puts a really big barrier and burden on our staff and it takes the fluidity out of a very fluid active document that should naturally have revisions when things aren't going well or do need to be changed because they're mandated. Um, but it doesn't stop it from coming before us whenever most likely available right after. Um, I don't, I, I think that's a burden that we're gonna put on our staff well, for no reason. And, and I guess the only thing, the only reason I have pause about this again is because of us being responsible for all curriculum that you know statutorily sure. we are so I would like to review it and yeah, if absolutely. there is an issue no problem. 
All right, thank you. All right, they, you know, we, we'll, we'll get them You can even you. just send me an email and. Well, <laughs> well, I think. We don't mind at all. Yeah. We, we, we I, actually like that it's public and clear. Yeah. We direct a lot of families to the site. It's not a problem at all. Ms. Hand has this meeting twice a week for the rest of the year, so, so we'll be fine. We, Plenty of opportunities to bring it forward. For the rest of the year. <laughs> Twice a week. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm about to throw a marker at you. Um, so maybe it would be helpful. I think it would be helpful to me. When we're talking about these course guides, are we talking about what you shared, Ms. Klein, about the, like the pacing guide? Are we talking about a pacing guide? Or are we talking about we're going to um, have a new course of, like, I mean, it doesn't say course of study, but I mean, in this, well, it does say course of study. But are, are, we, are we talking, like, if we're going to have a new class offered that the, you're handing, I don't know that I, I don't know that the board really wants to see you adjusted the pacing guide because it was going too fast. I, I, I don't think we need to approve that. Um, or we had some events, so we need to slow it down. Um, I don't know that that's what this policy is asking. So, I mean, but, so I, I, would, I think we need to get it get down to what is the that the board wants to see before it gets started, and what way do we want to see it? Do we want it have to come before a meeting and we're going to approve it, or do we're just saying are we just saying make us aware? I, I would say it says board for approval, and when you're looking at course guides, what do you what do you what is that envision in your mind? I know it's not so, the pacing so guide. So a little different. So if you went to our social studies webpage. Yep you would see a link for each of the courses. So yep. civics, US yep. history, uh, economics, you would see some curriculum resources, some guides and pacing, yep. some ancillary supports um, to ways to address diverse learners like our students with disabilities, how to modify the curriculum. Um, just see all kinds of things in a math. You're gonna see a lot more pacing just because that's mm -hmm. inherently math. Mm -hmm. um, in ELA, you're gonna see our specialists have pulled um, an ad um, depth to what's in the curriculum. Um, so they're all a little different depending on the course. Um, super easy for us to link to all of that if that is sufficient in a board agenda. Um, and we can, you know, put a little new or, you know, updated or not updated next to it or something like that. Really like our public viewing them, giving feedback on them. So it, it's not a problem at all. It just, the, the, the problem will be the language on the prior to implementation, um, given it's mostly just supplemental content or sequenced content. Um, honestly, it's a little easier to put them all. Um, okay, so. We can, we can get to yes anywhere. My, my one pause would be, it may not perfectly be before school starts from when they finish to when we can give you guys an update. But I don't see why by not early August. And the other, the other layer of that is, is that they're not going to teach the entire course on the first day. So you, you see what I mean? So like, whereas we're saying before you start, well, if you know the first week and a half is just basically finding the bathroom and telling them how to write their names at the top of the paper half the time, right? So I think we're in a good place if we can get to there. Not my class. Maybe well, your class. Not my class. Ms. Campbell, well, I mean, Campbell, like seriously, and, and again, like let's just guides. talk about the they're, first they're week They're guides for teachers, and some are used much more closely, particularly our new teachers, others less. Um, our veteran teachers um, are less dependent on those guides. We ask them to review them for mandatory content. There's yeah. a lot of mandatory content in our state. So, so uh, I guess, I mean, I'm okay with removing the before they are implemented. If they go on the agenda, then at least, honestly, annually. that will help um, yeah. with our public engagement to sure. seeing these changes and revisions. So I think that that's a win-win all the way around. Yeah. yeah, we agree. What do you guys think? Sounds good to me. Yeah, to not put the before, before they're implemented, yeah. but be for us to be able to review it. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think it's contradictory, too, by putting the implemented, because ultimately this is the role and responsibility of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. Adding the first check mark is just putting another eye on it, um, but if we put the implemented, I think it's taking the responsibility away from the superintendent. Well, I think it's doing us. Okay, moving on. Paul, do you have direction? Yep. All right, uh, moving on, 22, oh hang on a second, I gotta make sure, 2240. Controversial, Controversial issues. issues. Yes. Woo. Yes. All right, yes. here we go. It's actually not a very controversial policy. I know, I know. It's, it's really kids. not. It's, it's not. pretty benign. I know. Actually, I so every year I teach at the Teacher Leadership Academy. Um, um, Linda Buffum has invited me to do that. I just did it last week, and this is the policy I used to use, give them as an example. Um, but uh, it's it's pretty tame. And Neola hasn't. Um, 
uh, updated theirs. I just like B. Since I think this is also going to be one that's going to change with uh, my computer's logging me out for some reason. Sorry. Um, legislation to some degree. This ours is actually. Am I on the right one? Ours is longer. It's just broken up. Is it just the formatting? It's just making it. It's making it very clear and separate that parents can have concerns and communicate that with staff. Right. Yep. Yeah. So are we okay with just telling Paul, hey, listen, anything that's not inside there from the first Neola um, or from the Neola update, but we keep our 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 uh, yeah. Policy I don't. Here? Our our policy is actually stronger than the yep. Neola's policy. So if that's okay, and then in the event that something happens that updates it, it'll come forward to us with other ones. Yeah. This We're good also, with that, Paul? This one's also been done in the last five years. Yeah. Miss Campbell, you're excited to find those ones that have been in the last <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say, like, like oh, that's, I don't know. it's oh, good to do them now, one, though, so we don't we have to go, go through I this. I counted. There's 23. I'm like, there's 23. <laughs> okay. Skip. No. Okay. So. All right. We All right, so we're good. 2250. 50 innovative program. You mean to tell me we don't have it? We do not. We have, we have many some innovative programs. Unless it's somewhere else. Right. I, I truly believe we don't need this when I was looking at it. Um, you know, it basically puts handcuffs on any, any innovative program, has to put all of these things together in service requirements, assessment. It just, it's not needed. We okay with that? Yep. All right, moving on, 2260. I think our policy looks significantly different than Neola's I wrote, so I need to look at. This is the trouble with looking at these two months ago, because now I'm like, I don't remember. All right, we just updated this one last year. Oops. No many trees, Tammy, so saved by printing them in size four font. <laughs> It was just so this didn't look quite so bad when you're like, oh. All right. So. I think this is one that we can do is add anything that Neola suggests and keep any of the stuff that we have, if you guys are feeling comfortable with that. There's lots of options. Yeah. I mean, like the, what was this? The so our policy like kind of picks up towards officers. the middle of page two or something. It's like, it's like we missed the whole first page or something. <laughs> All right, anything, reward does not, all right, so it's, So again, this is um, something that clearly has been updated by the legislation changing last session. I don't see the oppressive comment. Oppressive. Hold on. I think is new is what I'm getting at. Gosh. Yeah, it looks like we took the first paragraph and then we opted for the second option on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any suggestions? Give me a minute. Sorry, this one's a long one. This is an 11 yep. pager. We found a longer policy. Right. Paul, do you want to make any suggestions to, to us on that Neola policy? I can go through and scan for anything that's been added since uh, we did and added into ours that we don't have. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. When, when I was looking through it, it pretty much just follows. Yeah. Are you okay with that, Ms. Campbell? Bring it back to us. Um, sure. 
Okay, Mr. Trent, we're good? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Moving on. 22. Let's see what the next one is. Make sure I don't miss one here. 22.60.001. All right, this is. All right, so there seems to be this ADA thing. Well, this looks like a... Ours has appeal process procedures. This looks like. What are you looking at? We're at 2260.01. Oh, Our yep. policy is different than theirs. Oh, yeah. Ours is not about 504s and disabilities. disabilities. Yeah. This is a part of a whole package that we did together last year on anti harassment and non discrimination. We did a whole group of policies kind of all at the same time. So do we need to, I mean, it, it looks like we obviously need to add this 2260.01 to match what theirs is and maybe renumber ours. I'm trying to see if this is maybe in a future. So I don't, is I don't the see. the same thing as the other one? No. So my, my gut feeling is 2260.01 from Neola is law. <laughs> is wrong? No, it's law. law. I mean, it's not, yeah, I don't yeah, think we no, need a policy on it. it looks very much like it. law. Yeah. But um, ours looks a lot, this looks a lot like law too. So the anti-harassment and non-discrimination appeal procedures. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure it is, uh, but the numbers for sure need to be yeah. changed. Fixed, yeah. Okay, so should we add in should Neola's 2260.01 and then change the number of ours to 0.02. To 0 .02. Well, we I think Neola has a 0 0.02 as well and a 0 0.03. Say what? No, that's, no, that's, no, that's 61. 61. You're yep. looking, yep. I'm saying 2260.02. Yeah. yeah, we can get them to renumber ours to be 0.02. Okay, and then add in their 2260.01 because we do not have I mean, there's actually parts of this that are in our 2260.01. We'll go with your direction. We got the gap open here. I'm going to go your direction real quick. Okay. Let's move us to the next one. Uh huh. What's the thoughts of the board? So the the compliance officers have this is is this just 504s? Mm -hmm. This is all federal stuff, so okay. we we do it. I was but trying to see like if we, we had one have, somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, we and have a compliance officer for this group. Right. Okay. Specifically for 504s? Yeah. And it talks about you're having to name them and everything, and mm -hmm. we do that. So. Do we have a separate male one and a female one? I saw that somewhere in there. I'm not sure what the point of that is. Well, depending on, on the event that took place, and you may want. Oh. You know. Yeah, yeah. So we need to look at this. Yeah. We, I'm not seeing anything just in a cursory glance that we have. We don't have any policies labeled 504. We have lots of policies that talk about 504. Adopt their 2260.01 and then rename ours. I think we're probably gonna run into ours somewhere else. Oh, because ours, this is just the appeal procedures. Um, right. Yeah, ours is the appeal procedure. For Theirs the policy is, before, yeah. Yes. Yep, yep. So what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Ms. Jenkins? Yeah, that's fine. I just, I feel like we have it somewhere, but. Mr. Trent? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Does our, does our, is there so much of a separate process, Paul, that that what we have in 2260 will not cover? Because this is still about discrimination. Right, I haven't done a line item. There might be things in as required by federal Yeah, I mean, this does, because this speaks specifically to somebody with a disability. Look at paragraph number two of this 2260.01. So right. there, there's probably a lot of overlap in how okay. we handle them. Okay. Okay, so moving on. Where are we at? Are we good? 2261. I think we got three of that. We're going to rename this one. We're at 2261. All right, 2261. If you go to the top.
top of it, Title I Services. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, when I looked at it, I didn't see anything I that was concerning. It seems like we had pretty much all of the options there. Um, if everybody's okay with it, I didn't see. The only thing I didn't see on there was the F portion, which is in ours, sim simultaneous services. Um, if you guys are okay with Paul updating it to include anything that may not uh, be in there that we currently have, because if you look down at F. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys are okay with that, we can move on. Yeah. Where are you saying F? Oh, ours? On our policy, we have okay. simultaneous yeah. services. That's okay. Yeah, and we there's actually there's something in under I don't know it's absolutely necessary, but under uh, yeah. participation there there's they've got a couple extra things in there. Okay. So update this one to match Neola's then, and still keep our simultaneous services, or at least have staff take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, two two six one zero one. Parent participation. And j because we had this conversation where there were only a few staff members in the room, even though they were probably watching from their offices. And just to clarify, because it looks like we're dumping a whole bunch of policies. I believe the direction of the board is, as we can get yes. to it. None if there's some are... that we come, like we did yeah. with the remote work, and say we need to do this, we need to do this now. But everything else is as we, because we, you know, it's not like you guys aren't working on anything else. Yeah. So. <laughs> Parent participation in Title I programs is what is. This is a good, if you guys read it, it's really good. Yeah. It talks about the development of all those other things. We, I wanted to say that um, there's been some push to possibly use, like, we could get more per parent participation with some of these if we were to try to get some sort of like a mobile fingerprinting to the actual locations. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like oh, a, yeah, and, that would be tremendous. And get the, we you know have one. I mean? like, we have, we have two, actually. The problem we have is, is that our staff, um, getting out there and doing it you know what I mean it right becomes, because it only certain people can yeah, do it so, and so asking, but we do have because I asked for them we yeah. have we have but then COVID hit so they like you we literally fingerprinting services to your school because I would like so to know. Inquiring <laughs> minds would love hand, to know this hand we've I've sent her an email and yeah, they're looking yeah. into it we're looking at it okay so yeah. the problem we <laughs> to be determined the okay. problem we had before is district security was having to do it and then it was they were on a uh, you know, didn't have the availability of many people, then we had COVID. So I think now they're co collaboratively looking at yep, how to do that. Look. Thank you. Or even yep. if we were able to just set up a, a one in each, each of our year, district, right. you know, periodically, that would probably be tremendous as helping I some of our agree. volunteers. We'll do what we can. Thank you. Yes. I just have to highlight while we have the opportunity is, you know, one of the ladies who works in the office who does that is a volunteer for them. She's yeah. an amazing volunteer. Um, but in our district security office? Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, is is that there wasn't That's enough. Amazing. Like, it, there was a there was a bandwidth concern. So I think Miss Han is going to put together an effective opportunity for it. So, if you guys are okay, the parent participation in Title One programs is really cool. Um, I feel okay that if we can pass the updated version that we have um, from Neola, it feels pretty good. Ours is the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's identical. Yeah. Ours is the same. Right or whatever. I mean, the our current point little one different. and point oh two are identical. Yeah. So, so if we're okay with any changes that might be there, if it's not identical or just moving forward, we're good? Yeah. All right. All right. Next one is 2261.02. According to Ms. Jenkins, they are identical. And so we if everybody's okay. 2018. Yeah. We're good to go? Mm -hmm. All righty. Moving on to 2261.0. Let me make sure we don't have... Yep, I zero three something. annual report requirements. I wrote something on here and I don't know why I wrote it because ours, ours is more extensive. Yeah. Yeah, I. Yeah. I like ours. Yep. I don't know why I wrote. I, I would say in this regard, if we can ask Paul to add anything that Neola has added into the original policy we have, but we have more that we require for ours than is required on that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're okay with that. All right, Paul, yep. Paul, you good? Yep. All right. All righty, moving on. 
I think I the next one's 2262. We don't have latchkey programs. Oh. No, we don't call it that. So that's why we're, we have a version number two, which is, again, identical. We call them school age childcare. Is that what you mean? Or what? That's, what is yeah, the I think latchkey is kind of a. When I was a child. Outdated. <laughs> yeah. That's what I child was growing of the up. 80s. Yeah. <laughs> or the 90s in some of our I was always in the Everglades. That's where I grew up. <laughs> All right, so if you look at 2262 version 2, it looks like... It's the same. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just going to mark that one reviewed. Yep. Next up, 2266. Non-discrimination on the basis of sex and education programs and activity. This is another one that's going to be updated with this legislative session. So. Yep. Do you want to pause on this one until it gets updated? I would say pause on this one, yeah. Well, I mean, it, here's the thing is we, we um, still send us an update if, if it needs to yep. be. Right. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. this was updated last this year updated as well. Year. Yeah, I, I feel confident that we just wait until they update it, and then we get it back. And right. the Title IX regs are also being updated right now, so yeah, yeah. they're going to change again you know, with the federal Good. law. It needs to be. Okay. Then we're good on that one. 2270 is the next one according to our booklet. Oh, yep. Religion in the curriculum. Um, there's there's some things inside the statute that mm -hmm. since this was here um, have been updated. Um, so these are statutory law. It's not like I'm trying to add these things to it, but I really like them. Um, talks about the district board shall install, and this was what was really cool, the district school board may install the public schools in the district a secular program of education, including but not limited to an objective study of the Bible and of religion. That's not in here. Also, the district school board may provide that a brief period not to exceed two minutes for the purpose of silent prayer or mediation be set aside at the start of each school day and each week. That's um, actually required by state statute that passed. Yep. The two, two minutes, one minute. I can't two minutes. See from that far away. Two minutes. One minute of silence. It, not to exceed two minutes. It's literally statute. Yeah. I'm reading it from the statute. And then what was interesting was is I pulled up another one that talks from the code law, and it had a couple of other um, additions to it that were interesting. But I think in this regard, religious in the curriculum, if if we're going to update it to include those things that I just spoke to and. Um, I think that's fair. Anybody else have anything that they want to add to it? No, I'm, I'm in favor of updating this policy, honestly. So I, um, yeah. So it would have to be our own updates because Neola. Yeah, it's just adding what is inside the statute to the actual policy. I, I'm going to need you to provide that and read that again. Well, if you'll, if you'll go look at 2103.45, you'll see what I just read exact. And all I'm saying is, is that we should just add it to the actual, um, to the policy. That's all. Yeah. Okay, we're good? I'm not good, I didn't say I was good. All right, well, if you wanna look at the statute, I mean, it's not, it's just, it's law. So we spoke about this before, about adding certain things to the actual um, policy that are law, that are pertinent. I think this one is one that we could do. All right. So all we're deciding today is if we're going to update this policy or not. We're not deciding exactly what's going to go in it and, and all that. That's what you're asking us. Do we no, I, I just, what it is is we have this one, which is um, we have the update from Neola, right, 2270. And inside of it, it does not speak to those things that are inside of the Florida statute, which are related to this, and it's referred to. So what I'm saying is we just add those two components of 1003.45 and that's it. Just add it to it. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Go ahead and list in there the uh, Constitution, the First Amendment. I, I mean, I don't <laughs> put it all in there as far as I'm concerned. That one's implied. Yeah. <laughs> I, d I did click on the link. I mean, is it actually linking to the whole Constitution? It does. It, it not does. the whole. It links to Amendment But it links to it. It so. links to the Amendment thing. 1, yeah. First Amendment. Yeah. All right. Um, are we okay with that? Ms. Jenkins, have you taken a look at it? Yeah, uh, you, you skipped a couple of words, so I wanted to read those, so thank you. Okay. Okay. So 2270. Um, we're good on that. Paul, you know the direction on that one? Yep. All right. 2271, articulation and access. 
is what our uh, to college system institutions. Ours is just titled. Yeah, it's just whatever. <laughs> it's the same thing. So I, I had a question on this one um, in regards to the second paragraph where we are uh, approving participation for students in grades 10, 11, and 12. And uh, the question of why not add ninth grade if it's a possibility, mm -hmm. Florida statute allows. She's saying we need to change that. <coughs> No, it's okay. You're good. I, I can hear you. You're yeah, this is one that we think we already have on our radar. Okay. Yeah, six through yeah. twelve is what Florida and statute Neola's says. And Neola actually has a 2023 update, and it, right. so I think this will probably we need to put this one in the hopper. This one's on your radar. Okay. Okay. So, Paul, you want to meet with staff and? Yeah, they'll get with you. Okay. Bring it back. Cool okay, beans. good. Haven't heard that in a long time. Cool beans. Yep, 2280. It's because I'm a child of the cool 80s. Beans. She said cool <laughs> beans. 2280. Used to work for a lady that that's what she said all the time. Okay, why, where are we at? All right. All right. Physical education. We go 2280. 2280. Oh, Hang on. Fit, what? We don't. The 22, 23. Well, we're, I mean, so if you look at Neola. We're missing some policies, though. We have a physical oh, education. Oh, oh, oh. They uh -huh. actually have Okay. And this so. may be updated from um, there's Florida statute references. Yeah, we don't. Do we not have this written in policy somewhere else, like further on in the book that I haven't got a to? Physical, we have a health committee. I don't know if we have a, do we have a physical education committee. SAC. SAC. Okay. What she said. SAC. I think she yeah. said. Shaft. 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 Yeah. Like Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal is coming. What, what are you saying? We have a physical education committee in the district. Meets in the sunshine with regularity. It's called SHAC. Okay. Cool. So, in other words, we're already in compliance with the law. We just don't have a policy we saying that we are. We don't have a policy. All right. So. Or maybe we do and it's in somewhere else. I'm going to. I think we should implement the policy. I agree. Students 9 through 12 should be required. Um, all right, so I guess we need to establish the amount of credits in physical education. They'll put that in there, staff will. Staff will? Because yeah. it says a minimum of one, but it's blank as though we're supposed to fill it in on this NEOLA template. Let's make them all work out. Tell them 12. 25. No. <laughs> 12. Listen, we listen. We run it every day. Yeah. All right. If we're going to move forward with this, um, are you guys okay with us offering it to staff to make that recommendation for yep. credits? And yeah. then that way we can see it coming back. Um, are you okay that, with that, Ms. Campbell? And then if you move. Yeah, we are yeah I mean, I haven't, this one I didn't um, get through all the, because I was mainly looking at the ones that we had. Um, I don't that's like. fine. I just, you know, I can read really fast. I can't read this fast. But I do know, I was looking just at really briefly, the middle school that you pick, you know, one class per one semester per year of physical education. But we, I know we've had in the past a PE waiver, so I'd want to make sure that we include that. Uh, oh, yep, I see there's a, for a waiver. Is that PE waiver by law? Um, I'm pretty sure it probably is. I believe it mentions waivers somewhere, but I'd have to double check. <coughs> I mean, because I, I. The waiver's in the next paragraph. I wasn't around when I was in school. I know. I, uh, <laughs> you, you had to go. You had to and go. And the PE waiver sometimes is, I don't know. Well, if, It's six if, or one half dozen. If then, we're going to err on the side of parental input, we better leave the PE waiver in there. It is not a graduation requirement. That the hope is, hope the is, hope is yeah. you know. Uh, Mr. Gibbs. But there's ways, you know, if, if parents, you know, you can take that through virtual school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be flexible. But... Well, and some of our students, I mean, I, my daughter's a perfect example. She she plays softball, but outside of the school. And so kids getting a lot of physical activity, but may not want to come into the school and do PE at the school. So right. that's why those waivers are, are Maybe useful. we make them play a sport would be your yeah. waiver. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> it says here that we, um, in some of that, it says that there's a physician that needs to be involved. Are we allowing that mm -hmm. to be the level? Uh, no, right, well, I don't, right, right now, it's just the parent has to, the parent signs the physician it. involved, where are you reading that at? Uh, it says, makes, okay, after, so you go uh, first whole section, right, sec, page two, mm -hmm. 
And there it says, provision shall be made to, at all levels to excuse individual students from specific activity if the directions do so in the writing from the student's position. So a doctor's name? I, That's optional. Yeah, optional. Yeah. I don't know, listen, I, I think there's some kids that could use physical education, but then again, you're right, because what they'll do is they'll just take it online, and then we lose that FTE, I guess. You know what I mean? Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, a lot of times, like, you know, I've had my kids take Hope Online so they can get another elective in. Yeah, that's true, too. That's a good point. Yeah, I think allowing the parents to make that decision. I right? think allowing the parents. I don't think you need to bog a physician down with handing a doctor's note to, to not participate in PE. If a parent says a student's not able to participate for some reason, we should take their word for it and honor that, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Ms. Campbell makes a great point. So <laughs> we won't say student's physician. We'll say student's parent or guardian. Yep. We good with that, Paul? Yep. All right. All right, so these policies get, all right, class size. 23, 12. Which, do we have a class size policy somewhere We're else? regulated by state for class size. I know, but I'm just. This is us saying I'm, I just more. looked, I, we don't have one that's specifically says class size. This is, we already do this. I just don't know if we're required to have it in, in policy. I think um, I would stay oh. away from this one. Yeah. <laughs> huh? I would stay away from this one. Yeah, I think I'm, it's a terrible idea. I yeah. think so too. <laughs> it's unrealistic. Paul, just make sure that we don't have to have this thing and I think we're here. good. Yeah, yeah we follow statutes. So. Right. Yeah, I think we're okay. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you 100%. Okay. All right, 2330, homework. Okay. Oh, yeah. So. Here we go. Here we go. This is going to be such a good Demand. reminder. So I'm excited I to talk to you guys a day. that Each class. Linda Buffum has me come in and and teach the last night of the Teacher Leadership Academy, which I just did last week. Fantastic. And this is the policy I use for a group discussion. I show them how to find our policies and when we're updated, but then I pull this one in and I say, <laughs> okay, because it's kind of short and it's relevant to them because they're all teachers. Say, take this policy, she puts them in breakout rooms and they, uh, I hope they're watching this meeting because if one of their assignments is they have to watch a meeting. Because um, I told them, I'm gonna bring your input to when we talk about this policy. Um, I put a break, do a breakout room, how does this apply to you in your classroom and bring it back? So there was a lot, um, we actually had some good discussions. So if you don't mind me taking just a few minutes, I'll yeah, walk you through. Love to hear it. So one of the things, you know, the first, comment was that it's vague. And I did explain to them, look, a lot of times our policies are vague purposefully because then you as the teacher in the classroom can be more specific. We're not prescripting right. out, being micromanaging how you do your homework. Um, but they, they did have this question, what does recent research say about the effectiveness of homework? Um, is it valuable? What about kids with little home support? Mm -hmm. um, there was one in letter E, it said, as a veg evaluation, excuse me, as a valid educational tool, homework should be assigned with clear direction and its product carefully evaluated. They, they really thought that was important, <coughs> that the product should be, that that was a good thing. Um, that we have a bigger focus on homework in elementary and in middle, it's more about completing their classwork if they didn't finish it at home or review and that we could maybe use this policy similar to what we, the request we've had on other policies to differentiate maybe what we say about elementary versus secondary because, mm -hmm. you know, they do function differently. Um, and so maybe to break down the differences more between elementary, middle school, high school, um, where it's less important for, you know, parents don't really have to help, you know, uh, and, and the higher up we go, the, the less some parents may be able to help. Um, even me pulling back those algebra one, because which I'm doing algebra <laughs> one for the fourth time now. Um, yep. So, you know, but anyway, just, just wanted to make sure I shared that input when we look at this. I, um, I think that's great feedback. I think we should remove the line where it says it should never be used as a punitive measure because there are times when kids are acting up in class and work can't be done and homework gets assigned and maybe that is not necessarily a punishment, but um, it is to some degree, so I think I would strike that from there. Yeah, sometimes th that can be a learning purpose. Yeah, I think the idea there is not, you didn't, well, I mean, because obviously, if you didn't finish your homework in class, your, your classwork in class, and you got to finish it at home, but mm -hmm. the punitive is like, okay, you guys got in trouble, so you have to go home tonight and write, I will not 
I love that. Da 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 for a hundred yeah. times. I, I'm <laughs> so. I mean, for me, I would say, I think it's something that you can put in a teacher's toolbox uh, to be able to use to possibly help. Maybe they can earn. I wholeheartedly disagree. Um, not all of our students are going home to stable families. Some of them are going to daycare till 7, 8 o'clock at night. Um, it absolutely should be not. There, there should never be a negative connotation intentionally surrounding your educational experience intentionally. Um, there are plenty of other consequences we can assign students. That is not beneficial. That will not help them learn more. <laughs> that will absolutely not change their behavior. There is no research to prove that it would. Um, and it is disproportionately going to affect our students who are oftentimes the ones who are struggling the most with attention or behavior. Um, I, don't, I don't think that should be at all taken out. I think teachers would know the difference if a student is. Go ahead. No, I, I'm just saying it, it's in practice it's good for it to be there, uh, teachers know how to give that class extra homework and say it's not punitive. <laughs> um, they'll, that's fine. I, I mean, they'll they'll get it across that they're actually so just saying? doing Keep more the work. Keep the policy the same, yeah. but they still just I do mean, it without Because again, that? for exact reasons, you're you're going to have the, people saying yeah. you're, you're giving math homework because of a punishment. Uh, uh, my, my son already says that, and it's yeah. not, but I mean, but, but the actual yeah, of intentionally students. giving it as a they punishment, that's, as a punishment. I don't agree. <laughs> right, so. The problem is sometimes in the classroom and at homework, the reason is is that many teachers give it um, just because they want busy work, and that's where this homework thing started getting hit with, we don't need so much homework at home, right? But there is some balance to having some work done at home, some work done in the classroom and stuff like that. I agree with you. I mean, I could have done it too. I mean, you just sort of assign extra work. So, that's how so it works. leave it like it is. Yep. I good. lose this one. That's okay. All right. It's moving on. Happy. <laughs> 22, We're moving on to 2340 field trips and other travel. We're getting slap happy. We only have 12 minutes, you guys. We'll get out of here. We're, well, so we only got to go through 35 more policies in 12 minutes, all right. Yeah, and then we'll just carry on to So evening. question before we, because we, we were, our next workshop was May 5th and that got canceled. Mm -hmm. So are we just gonna kind of hold these to one of those extra just Tuesdays do them we're putting in there, huh? Do them tonight. No, 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 no. It's what we said we would do. We're on like the 2000s right now. There's and literally no need. Hang on, Miss Miss Jenkins, I, just hang on just a second. Like we literally only have a couple more to I'm go. I'm going to take a point of privilege and tell you that my 14-year-old is going to be at home tonight by himself until I get home. And I anticipate tonight might be a little bit long anyway. So I would suggest that we're again not in a rush. We're doing the process. We're going through the we're going through there. But this this kind of right here, what we're doing right now, is a workshop type feel time. Let's take our time. Let's not feel rushed. I, I strongly would suggest that we, we have all those Tuesdays that we've specifically set aside to do this work. I would be more prepared myself to pick up some of these that I missed. Um, I, I do not want to try to rush through to get this done at the end of a board meeting. Okay, so if, if you guys notice, we said we needed to review the policies, right? We're on That's two, we're, we're on, Ms. Campbell, if you can just let me finish. So if we, if we are, are going to complete these, we are now on the 2000s. We started this process in January, and one of the issues we have is, is we always run into these situations. So what I would propose is we start at 9 o'clock then, and we get these things banged out during the day. Because we, at this pace, we will not get these done until, if we go at this pace, and we started in January, and now we're doing them now, what is it, May, and we're only on the 2000s, we won't have them done before Christmas. And, the, and I have an issue with that, like I really do. So, um, I mean. Let's, let's keep powering through what we're doing right now. I mean, I think we, we do need to honor Ms. Campbell and the fact that she is a mother and if she's a child at home alone, um, I, by all means, we don't want to keep you from your responsibility there. Um, I hear you 100%. So uh, let's keep going and let's see how far we get for right now. All right, we got That's nine minutes. Um, field trips and other student travel. Yeah, it is 2340. Yeah, this one needs to be updated. This one speaks to the fact of an area superintendent approving all trips within the state for more mm -hmm. than two days, which we don't, we no longer have area superintendents. Right, but the actual 
policy is reflective of. Mr. Susan, this is one on our radar that needs to be fixed. Okay. So do you want to take this one and fix it and bring it back to us with the NEOLA updates that pertain to it? We will work on it. Yes. Beautiful. You're going to bring that back in the next two months? Yeah. So we can get all of our policies done? In two months. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up, 2370. Let's see here. Make sure we don't have 2370 educational options. I had here just to check the statutes. This one needs a, a lot of updating. Yeah. Well, if you look at the updates that are on um, NEOLA, there's a couple of that are there. There's a couple of options that we can choose there at the bottom. So if you guys will take, go to 2370 and go down to the first, the bottom part of the first page, participation, and then it gives us mm -hmm. a couple of options to take a look at. Like our our maximum of credits is a little bit different than what um, many other school districts are. Yeah, they are. All right. So, I mean, we award letter grades, and this, this option one is talking about that it will be evaluated on pass or fail. Uh, letter grades shall not be awarded. This one, I think, I'll be honest with you guys, there's some of these um, blanks that this, the, our district's going to fill in anyway. What I would like to suggest is to allow them to take a look at this and come back with it because they're going to make those suggestions based on what our other policies are. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. With the performance being evaluated, pass, like all of yeah. that needs to go through there. Are you okay with that, Ms. Campbell, yeah. asking staff? This is one of those that's kind of, we're out of our league here, I think. <laughs> If that's okay. Everybody else good on that? I'm yeah. fine with that. All right. Twenty three seventy one. So they have a twenty three seventy point oh one, oh, which is virtual and We do need that. And we it's new that. based yeah, on the Yeah, we need that. Posture. We need that. Um it'll Yeah. We don't want to go too fast though because yeah, okay. That graduation requirement that's already passed, where the online course requirement has been removed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's maybe wait until the new packet comes out on this one. Okay. Yeah, because we're moving forward with stuff that's not even in there anyway. Okay. Yeah. Already, bring so that one back. You, so, but we don't. So, what we currently don't have this policy. So we're right. saying. Wait until. I mean, we can say implement it plus that checkbox because we have a district run one. Um, until the update if we need to, but by the time we literally get it finished through the process, it'll be like a month and then the new ones will come out. Right, the new ones will be out. Well, and I mean, I, this isn't gonna take a priority, so I would, I mean, I would say put it in the box of things that needs to be done, but it's yep. not. We can check the box and say it's been reviewed still, even though we haven't revised it yet. Or well, well we don't case, have we're not reviewed, right, we don't have this. So we don't so have this a can, box to check. Yeah, this On can this go one. at the end of the line. This one needs to be Because we're doing it. We are going to create it, right. All right, if you guys go on to 2371, you got V version one and I think version two. You have two different versions here. So we did this in 2020 when this came with the update. It seems to me that there's it's been actually, some updates. It's actually, we adopted it as a new policy in 2020. Mm -hmm. It seems that ours follows version two pretty well. Well, maybe not. I think it's version one, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Seems like we've got some more stuff in here. Yeah, this is version one. It's like version one to the T, it looks like. All right, are we okay? Why can it not open up my damn thing? I'm okay yeah. with this one. I think um, it's good to remind people that the Hope Scholarship, the, the last part of this policy, because a lot of families don't realize that they get the Hope Scholarship for one year. I've had I've had parents reach out to me and they're like, I don't know if I'm gonna have it anymore, uh, but that it remains in place until the student graduates from high school. So just reminding people of that. 
So we're okay with taking mm -hmm. the updated Neola version one? It's the well, same. It is the same, yeah. Is it identical? I mean, we have numbers and they have letters. That's really the only difference. Okay. It's a blend between the two, basically. Which what? It's a little bit of a blend between the two. The next one should be easy. We literally, this board adopted this in December. It's, yeah. So. It's School health services, yeah, oh, this one. You don't want to change it a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> We can skip it. Skip it. We did this one already. All right. 2411, guidance and counseling. Ooh, this one's going to. I have to open up new. Um, have I only opened the first batch? So this is virtually the same with the exception of the second part. The second section, we don't have one of the options. Be the responsibility of the classroom teacher who may draw upon the services. So I'm not sure. That that part that we don't have is a program of guidance or counseling shall be offered to all students and shall be the responsibility of the classroom teacher. Um, in some ways, they're kind of doing that with the mental health training, but I think that's a lot to put on them. Uh, yeah. Responsibility. Yeah, I'm yeah. okay with leaving it In out policy. too. policy. Okay. Yep. So, and this is an old Neola policy, also. So, they didn't. They don't yeah. really have any updates. Yeah. Ours is good. I mean, ours is actually better. So we establish a referral system which utilizes all the aid the schools and community offer. Yeah. We. They don't have a 2411. <laughs> uh, yeah. The only difference there. So we're okay on that one. I'm okay on this yeah. one. Keeping out that. So. Paul keeping it pretty much the same, yep. right? Yep. Okay. They do not have a 2411.01 college and career readiness assessment. I like it. We'll keep what we have. If you guys want to put in there anything about workforce, that's what my note said. Anything about trades. Talks about college career readiness, instruction through regular school programs prior to high school graduation, college career readiness. As long as you feel that that says you know what I mean? That there's um, we still we still do that, right? College career readiness assessment. Oh, yeah. um, the number on B number two, it says Florida Virtual School may be used to provide the college career instruction. We, um, I mean, I don't know, because I we we have BBS. I would say let's not let. Career and decision making course, and students are allowed to substitute that with virtual school if they choose. Can we make it to where they're not allowed to go to Florida Virtual School and they have to go to ours? No. <laughs> um, Just put it we in. We offer it through Brevard Virtual School, the course, and many of our students do it. Um, state law is pretty specific on the virtual options. Mine is taking it right now through Brevard Virtual School. Thank How about, you, Ms. Campbell. Shout out to BBS. How about we take out the Florida piece and just put virtual school may be used? Is that better? Roger that. Okay, we're good there, Paul. <laughs> We're going to make that one change. We're going to make go through the whole policy so we can make that one change. Well, I, <laughs> well, I, then, know, I'm, I hear you. Okay. I, you know, what? I'm just going to, I don't know if anybody's watching because we've been so boring for the last little bit. <laughs> but I just have to say, people need to understand Brevard Virtual. You can do everything with Brevard Virtual just about as you can do with Florida Virtual School. Unless there's just a course that we don't offer. But all the courses, most of the courses your kids are going to take, you can do through Revard Virtual School. Keep it local. All right, 2412, yeah. we've got Homebound Instructional Program. Um, so we have, it's pretty much identical. Identical. There's a line yep. in here. I yes. have a question. I understand why it's in there, being someone who had to teach hospital homebound. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're still legal by having it in there, um, the part that we have the right to schedule the time and place. I totally understand why it's in there, but yeah, I just want to make sure that we're still yeah. allowed to do that. I taught homebound also. It's a great opportunity. All right, we're good to go there? Yeah. All right, so what we'll do is, is it's 430. If we can earmark and say 2416, and then you guys feel okay that if- 15 because Neil has a 24-15. Yeah. Oh, dang it, Paul. Dang it. So you guys okay that if we move the uh, school board meeting to a certain time, we can get a couple more in? Or do you guys want to cancel off and do them at the next workshop? Uh, it's up to you guys. Sorry, say that again. Move the school board If we have a school board meeting that literally gets done at 7 o'clock, <laughs> but it might not because we have, we have like an hour and a half of administratives, but 
Yeah, I mean, if I, it's I just listen. I seven o'clock. By all I, means, listen, let's go. Let's just do this. I understand that we don't want to go into the night, right? Yeah. But we've got to get these done. I know. So I if agree, we can kind of find a schedule that works in both, I'm okay with it, as I have been since the beginning. But I'd appreciate that. Is that yeah. cool? Well, so, I didn't. I didn't know why we canceled May fifth. Yeah, I wasn't. Because it's Cinco de Mayo. Is that why it's was canceled? Well, it's no. also my daughter's <laughs> birthday, but I mean, I was still willing to go in the morning. I mean. Yeah. We're all going out for why, tacos why instead did we of dinner. We're going in the morning too. Oh, all right. we're good. We're we'll, let's so. let's gabble this and go. Okay. All right, good. Talk to you guys. There we but go. Why, but why